Good evening. Today is Tuesday, November 24th, 2020. It is 6 p.m. and we're in the city chambers and I call this city commission regular meeting to order. Uh, present with us are acting city manager Balia, city attorney Slayton, uh, commissioner Emmerich, commissioner Iannotti, uh, myself, Mayor Luke, commissioner McDowell, commissioner Langdon, uh, recording secretary Hale, city clerk Taylor, and we have police chief Garrison in the back. A uh, couple of notes, please um, remember to turn your phone on silent. Uh, and anybody wishing to speak, please fill out a card and turn it in to detect, detect, yeah, Detective Cooper. Thank you. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to ask our assistant city manager, Franco, to come up and lead us in Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to recognize three of the past commissioners that we've had. Um, commissioner, past Commissioner Chris Hanks, past Commissioner Joan Morgan, and past Commissioner Jacqueline Moore. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we're going to do the approval of the agenda. Uh, what I would like to do is move 6A to after public comment. That is the election of vice mayor. Uh, in the previous meeting on the 14th, city clerk and I went over just about everything imaginable on an agenda except for those, those things. So I did not pass the gavel when I made a motion, so it was null and void. Uh, at this point in time, we do not have a uh, vice mayor. So we're going to be going through that process and following Robert's rule at that point in time. Uh, and if, when we get to that point, city clerk will give us the instructions. Uh, is there anything else that needs to be moved? Right. I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as presented, moving item 6A to after the public comment number two. Item number two. All right, we have a motion on the floor by uh, Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich, uh, approving the agenda but moving 6A to after item two. Is there anything to that? Go ahead and cast your vote. And that passed five to zero. So with that, we'll move ahead to public comment. Uh, I have a card here from Greg Cooley. And then Jeffrey Scott, followed by Chris Hanks, please. Greg Cooley, Northport Citizen. I'm happy to see some new faces on this commission. Sadly, I don't think us citizens have been well served by Mr. Emmerich and, two, and the two recent commissioners. There was simply too much self-serving going on among the, th among the three of them, and us citizens just became forgotten about. I just hope this is a new beginning tonight. For you three that just won your elections, congratulations. Now, on to business. On October 27th, the previous commission accepted most in whole Peter Lear's separation proposal. I, for one, am glad he's gone once and for all. But I'm not happy by reinstating him in September. This commission handed him the opportunity to develop a $140,000 golden parachute package for himself, which in my opinion is almost extortion in this city. Then, this commission voted to have Julia Belia act as city manager, along with a 5% raise until a replacement can be hired. So I'm going to ask these questions. Why did this commission just increase Mr. Yarborough's salary, yet not elevate him to interim CM? Why do you throw our tax dollars around like confetti, and it's meaningless? If you want to throw around tax dollars, throw me a tax refund. Why did, you, why did this commission hire two city assistant managers the previous four years if they're not qualified or ready to step into the CM position? 
These two assistant CM jobs are costing us taxpayers well over $275,000 a year in salaries and benefits. And it's pretty obvious by the actions of this commission, you have no faith or confidence in either one of them if you will not see, seat either of them as an interim. So I'm asking this commission to make a motion, debate, and then vote tonight on one of these two options. Remove Julie Bilia as interim CM and rescind her race. And appoint one of the two assistant CMs as interim until a permanent person is hired. That's supposed to be part of the assistant CM job qualification, isn't it? Or, two, terminate both assistant CMs because they are unqualified and not ready to assume the position of city manager and leave Julia Bia in place until a new CM has been hired. If I were a current North Point assistant CM, I'd be looking for a job, and it's apparent neither will aspire to the seat above them. Better yet, can I apply for a North Point assistant CM job and earn well over $100,000 a year? A year? I can do that job with very little responsibility and not be expected to step up when a problem arises at the CM level, so hire me. The favoritism, partiality, and drunken sailor spending by this commission to City Hall has got to stop. So I'm reminding all five of you, you work for us, the citizens and the taxpayers of Northport. You do not work for City Hall. And the favoritism, reckless spending of our tax dollars has got to stop, and it stops tonight. Quit finally, quit pampering City Hall at the taxpayers' expense, period. The city employees work for us, too, and we get a say in their pay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Scott. I'd like to welcome the two newly elected commissioners. Welcome. This should be quite the ride. I do not believe our city commission or public administration has any credibility left after yet another year of breaching the public trust. Our commissioners cannot govern the city of Northport in a reliable and responsible manner. What our city commissioners fail to understand is their rhetoric and policy positions are void of any tangible benefits to those of us who pay for this oversized and unwanted government bureaucracy. Their exceedingly foolish policy positions and policy decisions have caused irreparable damage to the city's integrity and stability moving forward. Hopefully our commissioners haven't lost sight of their objectivity and impartiality in addressing tonight's agenda items or in serving the public trust. Let me be clear, it is essential that every public policy initiative that appears on this evening's agenda is analyzed and evaluated with rational objectivity. City government relies on its legitimacy to govern. What does all this mean in practical terms? It means holding our city commissioners accountable for their actions and the actions of staff without hesitation. Once a city commission and public administration has jeopardized its legitimacy, their ability to remain credible with the voters will be difficult to repair or resurrect moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yep. Mr. Hanks. Thank you. It's good to see my fellow former board members, the new uh, board members, my uh, folks I've worked with, my colleagues, and my friends. So it's good to see you guys. Congratulations to the two, and, uh, and I look forward to uh, watching this board serve. I, I want to talk to you about uh, what, what's coming up concerning the vice mayor. Um, item 6A. I think it's a very important. Everybody does remember how that meeting went and the intention and the purpose behind it. I was the only one voting on leadership and not on rotation. And so uh, though I agree the fact you should do that, I think it is important that we remember the words that were spoken, the expectations that e everyone up there had. And uh, I hope you make the right decision toward this. Uh, Mr. Emmert should be the next vice mayor. Vice Mayor, love you. You served as my Vice Mayor. You also served as my Mayor. But I think it is time that we move on uh, to some other leadership to allow them to grow up and to kind of move into a position that ultimately um, everyone should be able to see. Thank you. Thank you. And happy birthday, one day removed. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk, anything online for the general public? Yes. It's from Robert Shoti. I would like to address the out of control public comments that are currently allowed by the past and current mayors, especially when it comes to their supporters. The personal attacks against certain commissioners and city staff, slanderous remarks, 
remarking on what certain commissioners are doing during the meeting at certain times and use of props such as trash cans is making a mockery of our city. It has become a three ring circus and an embarrassment. The ABCD supported presiding commissioners are allowing anything their supporters want to say and have said as much as during meetings. These commissioners are ignoring city policies, which states persons addressing the commission, any person making personal, impertinent, slanderous, profane remarks, or who willingly utters loud, threatening, or abusive language, or engages in any disorderly conduct, which would impede, disrupt, or disturb any orderly conduct of any meeting, hearing, or other proceedings shall be called to order by the presiding officer. I would also like to address the illegal election of vice mayor at the meeting on November 14. Again, the same two commissioners circumvented city code section 2-61B2, which states mayor's ability to vote. In accordance with city charter section 5.03, the mayor shall have a voice and a vote on all questions and items and is called last. The mayor may move to make motions upon passing the gavel to the vice mayor or in the absence of a vice mayor to any commissioner. Mayor Luke did not pass the gavel per city code. This election was illegal. Also, why is a commissioner allowed to hide legitimate, legitimate posts on her commission social media site? This, in essence, deleting the post as no one can see it. Thank you for your time, and hopefully you all will do what is right for all the citizens of Northport and not just a few individuals. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, we will move on to 6A. I think what we will do, if you don't mind, city clerk, I'll let you explain what the procedure will be, and then we'll call for public comment before we proceed with the item. Is that all right with you? Okay. So each of you will have in front of you your, um, your suggested motion sheet, and in there it does explain the procedure to so where um, the mayor will call for nominations on the vice mayor, and at that time, You'll just state, I nominate and insert the name for vice mayor. If then the mayor will call for any more nominations, if there are none, then it will just be a vote on that individual person. And if they get a majority vote, then they will become the vice mayor. Or if there's more than one nomination, she will take the vote in the order that the nomination was made. Um, and then the first person, if they do get a majority, it will not go on to the second nominated person for a vote. It does not have to be a motion either. Thank it you. is just nomination, and then she will call for the vote. There's no motion. And that is per Robert's rule. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Uh, public comment. I have one card for this item. Justin Willis. Good evening. <clears throat> During the meeting on November 14, 2020, I gave public comment voicing my disappointment with the actions of, of Mayor Luke and her appointment of, of Debbie McDowell as the vice mayor. Just moments, just moments before taking advantage of the newly elected commission, Commissioner Luke promised to help those commissioners through the process. Unfortunately, that is not what we saw. We saw our mayor take advantage of the two new commissioners after a motion was already made. I do not feel that it would be right for, Ms. for Commissioner McDowell to accept the position of vice mayor because she has already accepted the position of vice mayor and mayor on a rotational basis. She has set the precedent that she feels it should be rotational based off of her past actions and words. During my public comment, Commissioner McDowell can be heard disagreeing with me that the crab and the commission spoke about the rotation for hours. I would remind her to mute her mic while on Zoom and also look back at those previous meetings to remember exactly what the conversation was. While on the topic of live mics, Commissioner McDowell, you were heard clearing your throat several times after the nomination was made. It sounded as if you were, um, as if you were um, signaling to somebody to do something. After that, you then pounded your hands on the desk. Your mic was live during that time. Was this an attempt to signal somebody, or was it to be disrespectful to Commissioner Emrich? I understand that the commission, minus Carazone, later decided not to send the rotation to referendum, that they felt that the, the commission could handle this on their own. Please remember that there were several items that were discussed for referendum, but did not get put onto the ballot due to COVID. Luke stated that it did not need to be followed because it was not put in the charter, yet she expected to be made the vice mayor and mayor based on the rotation, as evident by her prepared statement for accepting the mayor position. 
On 11-12-19, Carrizo nominated Emmerich as vice mayor. Luke's response was, and I quote, actually, I wouldn't mind being it, and I kind of expected it being because of what you had said last year. At that point of time, Carazone asked, how do you remember what I said last year? Luke's response was, last year you said it should follow suit with the way that they were elected, and because my time came in before his time, I expected it to occur this way. Luke was then appointed vice mayor after, after Emmerich was initially nominated, again following the rotation. According to some people within the community, I owe you both an apology. I have to agree with them. I owe you an apology for not being more direct in my reasoning for being upset with the vote that was had. Had I expected to see what happened, I would have been prepared with a statement. We ask you today to please do the right thing and continue to follow the rotation that both of you accepted your position on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, online comments, please. This one is from Debbie Miller. I would like Pete Emmerich to be vice mayor. John Cook, second chance, now is the time for the city commission to right the wrong. Former mayor Deborah, Debbie McDowell was the vice mayor and then the mayor and recently voted as the vice mayor again. Currently there is a civil investigation into her acting outside of her role as the mayor and listening into a private phone call for West Villagers for responsible government. She should not be rewarded for costing us taxpayers more than $25,000 in legal fees to defend her when she never asked permission to listen in on that conversation. She should not be the vice mayor and go back to being a commissioner while this court case is being vetted. Hopefully commissioners will vote on a rotation and not make this a popularity contest. Everyone should get the chance to be the mayor and the vice mayor during their term. That's basically what Jill herself said several years ago. Hopefully her amnesia is over. This one does not have a name. I believe the way Commissioner Luke handled the vice mayor appointment was very wrong. She didn't instruct new commissioners how to properly make a motion and completely disregarded Commissioner Langdon's nomination of Commissioner Emmerich and went full speed ahead with her own motion. What a blatant manipulation. Commissioner McDowell has been vice mayor, then mayor, and I believe it should be Commissioner Emmerich's turn. It da it's downright dirty and gives such a horrible start to the new board. I also believe Jill should have recused herself from voting for herself for the mayoral position simply because it has financial gain and could very well be unethical. Commissioner Iannotti, please do not start this four-year term with distrust of the citizens. Stop the dirty tricks. Kathleen Garrity, please do the right thing in giving Pete the due position of vice mayor. Don't overlook the need to provide guidance and assistance to your new commissioners, as Jill stated in the introduction ceremony. Sadly, she took it upon herself to forget that promise by not giving Barbara Langdon, Langdon proper protocol in making a motion to nominate Mr. Emmerich for vice mayor. Your public will be closely watching your proceedings during this important upcoming term. Don't let us down, please. Anonymous. Good evening, commissioners. After watching the November 14 meeting, I was very upset by the actions of commissioners Luke and McDowell. Luke more so than McDowell. Her promise to help her fellow commissioners was shattered by broken promises and manipula manipulation. The illegally made motion was met with quick karma. I am glad to see that this again is a topic of discussion, seeing that McDowell and Luke were both made mayor by rotation as proof by Luke's prepared statement, she obviously expected to become the new mayor. It is time for them to fix their ill-perceived actions and do what is right by the city. Make Emmerich the next vice mayor. And that's all. Thank you very much. All right, as uh, the clerk has described what goes on, we're following Robert's rules. Uh, there is not motions, there is nominations, and then voting is done on the nomination. So at this point in time, I will open it up for nominations. Um, Madam Mayor, I have a nomination. In keeping with our practice of electing our mayor and vice mayor on a rotating basis, I nominate Commissioner Emmerich to be our vice mayor. Thank you very much. Are there any other nominations. Go ahead. Um, I'd like to nominate um, David Iannotti as vice mayor. Okay, thank you. Are there any other nominations? That's all, okay. Uh, per the ruling uh, that was 
we were told to do. Uh, we will now vote on uh, the first nomination, which is Commissioner Emmerich. So if you will open up your voting pad and vote on Commissioner Emmerich as Vice Mayor. Uh, that passes three to two. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich is now Vice Mayor. I am going to um, break for five minutes while we switch around uh, the chairs and various things up here <coughs> on the dais. It is 6.20. We will come back at 6.25.
It is 625 and we're back in session. Uh, we are now at the point of announcements. So clerk, take it away. Vacancies for the following boards and committees include the Art Advisory Board, Audit Committee, Beautification and Tree Scenic Highway Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, Joint Management Advisory Board, Police Officers Pension Board of Trustees, Northport Youth Council, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Public Utility Advisory Board, and Zoning Board of Appeals. The upcoming expirations for the following advisory boards and committees. Charter Review Advisory Board, Northport Youth Council, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, and Public Utility Advisory Board. One Northport resident to serve on the Sarasota Manatee Metropolitan Planning Organization Citizen Advisory Network. If anyone would like more information, please see the City Clerk's Office. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll go on to consent agenda and acting city manager. Has anything been pulled? Yes, ma'am. We have one item, item 4H, CCSAP-20-238. Special event assistance for the Artesians Winter Market Event. Thank you very much. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion, Mayor. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve consent agenda pulling item 3H, 4H, I'm sorry, 4H um, for discussion. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, we have a motion on the floor by uh, Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Vice Mayor Emmerich. Uh, to approve the consent agenda as presented, but pulling 4-H to be discussed. Anything to the motion? All right, go ahead and vote. And that's approved 5-0. to zero. So acting city manager will go ahead and take up H, please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is with respect to discussion and possible action to award funds for the Special Event Assistance Program to the Northport Area Art Guild, uh, Incorporated DBA Northport Art Center to cover the costs of city fees and or resources associated with the December 5th, 2020 Artesians Winter Market Event. Um, this organization has requested assistance uh, for $440 for this event under the assistance program. Um, in accordance with um, the criteria, they would be eligible um, for $500. Uh, however, the city uh, staff costs uh, are less than that. They're actually uh, only $262. Um, so there is, uh, we do have an error, and I apologize in our staff summary, but it should really read $220, although, excuse me, $262 that they would be eligible for based upon city costs and fees, uh, although they're recommending a little bit higher, $440. Uh, are there any questions? Does anybody have a question? Commissioner <coughs> McDowell. Um, city manager, in the legislative text, it said that if this was approved, the resulting balance would be $5,600, and that was using the original um, $400, but we did have another special event that was approved in this fiscal year for the um, Halloween event. And what is the actual total then balance? Because Yes, yes ma'am. And, th and thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I erred in also not mentioning that as well. Um, you, you are absolutely correct. Uh, we we did have another event, which was held on October the 27th, excuse me, the City Commission approved uh, on October 27th, 2020 Commission meeting, $265.68. So if you take that into account, and should the Commission approve this evening the $262, we will then have a balance of uh, $5,472.32. So currently, we have a balance of $5,734.32. Yes, ma'am. What is the total of that pot to start with each fiscal year? That pot, this particular fiscal year, is $6,000. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
Any please. Um, why is the commission reviewing? Is the your is your mic on? I'll get it. It's just going to take me a meeting <clears throat> or two. <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering why this commission is reviewing such a small line item. When the commission uh, developed this program, uh, it was based upon the fact that certain criteria would need to be met, and um, when when people would have certain uh, civic functions and community events, things of that nature, um, depending on how much um, their event was costing and how much city services were involved, they would uh, qualify for a certain amount of assistance. In this case, it's five hundred dollars. However, the, the staff costs for the event are, are much less than that. Uh, so with that, commission, uh, it is commission approved. They have the uh, authority to review each request after it's been vetted through a city staff process. And they will make a decision making powers here at the commission level. Thank you. Um, acting, another question, please. Acting city commissioner, uh, city manager, do you feel that staff um, is, is appropriate and able to make those kinds of determinations without commission advice and input? Yes, ma'am, because what they, are, what they are actually doing is uh, they're reviewing it. Um, they has, have a series of city staff that review it, and the staff that has to provide the services for the events, they will submit to the uh, Planning and Zoning Division. They will submit those costs, and they have to, you know, for example, if it's solid waste, they have to show we have to do uh, garbage collection and recycling collection right. at, at this many containers. So there, there is, they have to show costs, and the planning division is merely transmitting those costs to the commission. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, this was a commission-driven initiative, mm -hmm. and so it comes to us generally through consent, and the only reason that this one was pulled was because it was the inaccuracy of it. Usually it's just passed on with the consent agenda. Okay, because thank there you. was an error, this one was pulled. But we requested definitely, I mean, it was commission direction to do it this way. And that way we could watch how much money we had left in that kitty because we have used it all. So. Thank you for that explanation. Of uh, anything else? Uh, acting city manager? <laughs> no, ma'am. Thank you. OK, no problem. Uh, if there's no other questions or statements, I'll entertain a motion. I'm sorry, go I'll ahead. i make a motion if nobody else wants to. Please do. I don't want to be the only one making motions. I, and it appears that's what I'm doing today, but that's OK. Um, but uh, if anybody else wants to make a motion, please feel free to jump in. Please go ahead. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda regarding the um, the uh, Art Guild's <laughs> special event um, program for $262. Second. Thank you very much. There's a motion on the floor to approve uh, the Art Guild's um, special event permit in the amount of $262. Uh, motion by Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Langdon. Anything to that, ladies? Anybody else? Take a vote on that, please. And that passes five to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, moving along, we have a public hearings we're going into and second reading. So clerk, would you read that by title only, please? Ordinance number 2020-46, an ordinance of the city of Northport, Florida, amending the non-district budget for fiscal year 2019-20 by transferring $1,073,612 from the road reconstruction fund balance, transferring $2,208,870 from the road reconstruction bond debt service fund balance, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much. Uh, Acting City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is the second public hearing uh, for Ordinance 2020-46, which is the budget amendment. The Road Reconstruction Fund 330 was charged the $1,073,612 in the road rehabilitation cha charges in fiscal year 2019 
and this amendment will use the remaining funds in the fund balance to cover these expenses. This will use all remaining monies in the fund and close out the fund to any further activity. In the Road Reconstruction Bond Debt Service Fund 205, the fund balance in the amount of 2208870 was used to pay the down balance of the debt during the refunding approved by City Commission. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, before we go on to questions, uh, do we have any public comment on this item? I do not. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, Commission, questions? All right, seeing none, we'll close that public hearing and entertain a motion. Mayor, I'll make a motion. Thank you. Make a motion to approve ordinance number 2020-46 as presented. We have a motion on the floor by Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Vice Mayor Emrich to approve ordinance number 2020-46 as presented. Anything to the motion? All right, call the vote. Maybe. <laughs> All right, that passes five to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, on to ordinances, first reading. I will need a motion in order to allow the city clerk to read it by title only. So would somebody make that motion? I move to direct the clerk to read the ordinance by title only. Second. That, that was triplicate. <laughs> <laughs> A motion made to uh, have the clerk read the ordinance by title only by Commissioner Langdon, seconded uh, by Vice Mayor Emmerich. Anything to the motion? Let's call the vote. Five to zero. Clerk, you have permission to read by title only. Ordinance number 2020-40, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, restating, amending, and repealing portions of Chapter 66, Article 3 of the Code of the City of Northport, Florida, relating to the Road Maintenance Rehabilitation Program, the Road Rehabilitation Fund, and the Construction Traffic Road Fee, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much. City, Acting City Manager, would you um, introduce this item, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is an ordinance um, number 2020-40, and this deals with uh, the road construction traffic fee, uh, making some changes to that, as well as some housekeeping issues. And at this time, I'd like to call uh, Monica Bramble, Acting Public Works Director, to provide us with the presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Monica Bramble. Acting Public Works Director. In 2006, an ordinance established the Road Maintenance Rehabilitation Program, the Road Rehabilitation Fund, and the Construction Traffic Road Fees. This proposed ordinance restates, amends, and repeals some portions of that Chapter 66, mm -hmm. Article 33 of these programs and provides for a fee waiver and the process for that fee waiver. So a property owner applying for a building permit for non-residential or commercial development can apply for the fee waiver of the construction traffic road fees. There are certain criteria that that applicant must meet. If that application goes to the director of public works and they will recommend then to the city manager to make a full determination as to whether the application will be granted or not. The applicant must provide a performance guarantee in the amount of 100% of the total construction traffic road fees they are asking to be waived. And then there is a contract that they must enter into with the city. If this um, ordinance 
is approved, staff would come back with a template for that contract agreement for approval by commission. This proposed ordinance also has provisions for enforcement of the um, waiver if the applicant does not follow through with everything they stated in the application. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk, do we have any public comments on this item? On I do not. Okay, thank you very much. All right, time for questions. I believe Go ahead. the one that I just handed you, Vice Mayor, was that for this item? No, that was for 6B. Okay, not 5B. all right, thank you. Thank you for checking. Uh, Commissioner McDowell. I don't understand the reasoning behind a waiver. The purpose is to help protect our roads and it's to help maintain our roads. It's to help so that we don't have to go to a road bond again in 20 years. Help me understand what the thought process was behind having a waiver. Currently, the way the uh, construction traffic road fee is designed, it is um, for non-residential users to uh, submit a fee for, for the waiver, excuse me, for the waiver. It will only pertain to non-residential for commercial and industrial. So if they can show us, and we have had inquiries to that effect, that they are not using any city roadways to access their construction sites, um, they would qualify for an exemption from the, from the road construction traffic fee. Um, Probably, in just looking at the way the city is laid out, most likely uh, the area of West Villages is, is most likely going to be, you know, predominantly the, the ones that will be requesting exemptions. Uh, they can come off of I-75. They can come from, you know, US-41 to the north and then hop on, I you know, 41 from either 75 to access the West Villages uh, subdivisions. Um, and not having a basis for charging a fee if they're actually not using our roads is, is another um, item that the city would have to contend with if that were the case. But this would open it up for all commercial to be able to request the waiver. And it seems the area that would be exempt is the West Village's area because they maintain their roads. Why not just say West Village's area of development is exempt from paying this road rehab fee instead of going through this whole waiver process, which then opens it up for all other commercial development in the city that is tearing up our roads? One of the provisions is in the application, they must show us the trucking routes so you could have a developer in the West Villages that taking supplies there, um, disposing of materials, may come and use city roads. So by exempting a whole area, they still may impact city roads. And that's why there's the fee waiver so that they can show us and we can look at the route that they're taking and know exactly that they are not impacting any city roads. What city roads are in the West Villages area? I mean, they could come through the city. They could get supply somewhere in the cities. The disposal site, they may come through the city. What Monica is saying is that you may have, um, you may have a, a subcontractor that lives in the city of Northport and traverses city roads and carries supplies on his vehicle or has a commercial or industrial establishment that he's bringing construction materials from in the city limits to West Villages. In that case, they would not qualify because they have to provide us with a traffic plan and it has to include the routes of all their contractors and subcontractors as well. So who, who's going to follow around these truckers to make sure that they're going on the right routes? How does, how does that look in practicality? On paper, it sounds wonderful, but in practicality, how does that even work?
Okay. Um, I guess it doesn't. <laughs> We only have currently provisions um, for the traffic control plan. I mean, I suppose we could in include add verbiage to address that about honesty. Okay. And, and there is in there, there's enforcement there. They have to comply. So if they provide us a road plan mm -hmm. and we find that they are not using that, I think it's, it's, in any ordinance, if, if we're not looking over the shoulders all the time, but if we find that if you not meeting the requirements of the contract that you made with the city, then you forfeit the security, you have to pay the construction tra traffic road fee. Again, it sounds really great on paper. Practicality and in theory and in practice, I don't see it happening. I, all I see is taxpayers picking up the bill for maintaining these roads because they're not going to be honest it's going to save them five thousand plus whatever amount of money so um, I will move on to the next part um, the construction road fee I specifically asked for a copy of the study and boy am I glad I did so since 2006, we have been assessing 50 cents a square foot of the building for residential or commercial. Commercial, I think, was 75 cents. Yes, ma'am, 75. Since 2006, and based on the conversation we had at 4 o'clock, the cost of construction has exponentially increased since 2006. So I would have thought that that 50 cent price would have increased also to help offset those costs of our roads. So then I look at the study that was done by an outside service in 2006, and their recommendation for a single family was $1.40 per square foot of the building and $2.08 of commercial. We, we aren't even charging half of what they're recommending. Yet our roads, yes, we did a road bond, but that road bond and those roads are going to deteriorate over time. And the cost of construction of these roads far exceeds what we have been able to afford. And it is evident based on previous conversations just today, we are not charging enough to be able to maintain our existing roads and put money aside or when the road bond roads start to deteriorate because of usage. To charge 50 cents is then only putting those costs of development and costs of growth right on the backs of the taxpayers. So my long-winded question <laughs> is, how do we justify keeping 50 cents and 75 cents per square foot now of all buildings um, when the costs are far exceeding what we're receiving in, ex in exchange. Staff is looking at that um, study and updating provisions and looking at cost of constructions and we'll come back to commission with a revision to the fees. With all due respect, why didn't you guys do that before you brought this to us and make it a complete discussion item? Instead of, oh, we're going to come back. I'm finished, Mayor. Mr. Iannotti, do you have anything? I would just say that, you know, I'm in agreement that I don't see how anyone's not using the city roads. There would be so few circumstances where that would apply. And more importantly than that, it's, it's not enforceable. And if it's not enforceable, then it shouldn't be. Entertained. Is that all? That's all. Nothing. Uh, Commissioner Langdon, anything? Uh, I've got a couple of things, and of course, the cost was was one of them. All, all through the ordinance, we're talking about how we're not getting enough money. Uh, I totally understand, though, the exception 
because this is for new development, new construction. So I understand those who do not utilize our roads are unfairly being charged if they're not using it. And that is the purpose and the intent of, of what this ordinance is about. So I understand that. Uh, I mean, this, this was, the study was done pre-road bond era. You know, I think it would behoove us to look, I mean, this thing is 14 years old at this <laughs> point. And as I said, pre-road uh, bond era. So I think it would behoove us to look at doing something like that. Mobility fees would be, again, I'm pushing mobility fees because you would be able to utilize that in some of this uh, restoration. This only handles new construction, new development. And as I said, I understand why it's being put in uh, for those who do not use the roads. Uh, I do have a question in regards to a couple of definitions. If you go to the definitions and look at multifamily residential. I'm not understanding. It says a building consisting of three or more dwelling units for purposes of division, condominiums, individual mobile home units are also classified as multifamily residents. I'm a little baffled at how a mobile home is multifamily. Mayor, Mayor, I think we can help you with that. Uh, thank you. This is Assistant City Attorney Margaret Roberts, who worked with Public Works on the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. The definition of multifamily was structured at the time that the study was done. So they studied the city and categorized certain uses to be able to um, implement the study. And so this is the definition that they have included. Now, with regard to uh, the statement of individual mobile homes, I think the concept there is a mobile home park is considered a multifamily park or site. And therefore, that's why that it does strike you a little odd there because it's, it's multifamily and then they're talking about individual units. Yeah. That individual unit would be classified in the multifamily group rather than a single family type uh, classification. So I think that's the distinction they were making primarily based upon the way it was studied. I, I think it would behoove us to look at that language <laughs> and so that there's a clear understanding that it is a mobile home park or whatever, you know, terminology, because when it says individual mobile home, you think of just simply a trailer. So I think it would, uh, again, behoove us to do that. Uh, on the next definition, uh, trucks. We spent a really long time uh, a couple years ago defining truck uh, because of weight and tires and you know, that type of stuff. Is there any tweaking that was done to this because of that truck definition and other ordinances? And I see city. Mayor, I think you're referring to some definitions that were drafted maybe in the parking yes. ordinance some time ago. Yeah. And those definitions are specific to that part of okay. the code only apply to that portion. So the answer to your question is no. Okay, thank you. All right, that is all the questions that I have. Um, Commissioner McDowell, your light is on. Go ahead. A couple other ones. Um, when you look at the, speaking of definitions, on 66-69A, I'm sorry, B, B, it says, developed property shall not be charged construction road fee. 
when I went to go and see what does developed property mean, what's the definition of it, there was none. Just like improved property, I thought would be a, a more accurate description, improved property, that's also not defined in the ULDC. Neither one of those are defined in the ULDC. Um, so I, I, I came up to, my thought was, we had a home, have a home, and my husband got a shed, and it had to be delivered, and I had to get a permit to be able to put a shed on our property. Um, would we be subject to the road bond fee, even though it's not being constructed, technically it might be, it's being delivered, I don't know. And I thought maybe we need to make sure that this is clearly defined so that others are not charged for getting a shed delivered or a pool installed, um, that kind of stuff. So we actually do have a definition in this ordinance on page four of 10 under 66-67. Develop property, a parcel or portion of real property on which an improvement exists. Improvement on developed how I miss property. <laughs> uh, includes I need to get these looked at. Sorry, <laughs> but it's now limited to buildings, parking lots, and outside storage. Okay. So I, I understand we need to look at this rehabilitation fee um, ordinance much more closely. I'm still hung up on this waiver because if you're waiving a delivery of, I don't know, lumber to the West Villages, but on that same truck is a delivery to, I don't know, Talon Bay or to Woodlands community. How does that truck driver not get charged because he's got those three on there and how, how does that work? Because He's delivering to the West Villages, mm -hmm. and that would constitute as a waiver. But what about the others? The, the others that he's delivering to are going to pay the fee because they're not exempt. The charge isn't going to go to the truck driver. It's going to go to the developer. So the home in Talon Bay, that home will be paying a construction traffic road fee. Okay, so because this is only construction for commercial. Right. Yes, ma'am. I think you're opening Pandora's box with this waiver and it's gonna create a lot more problems than you're trying to solve. And I think, and, and this is just my opinion, and I know this is part of the legislative process and this is our role as commissioners is to find the best way to have the language read. It should just, if you're going to exempt an area because they're taking care of their roads, just exempt the area. Instead of putting in this waiver process and having the city manager approve it, because eventually he just might be approving everything. It, it, it's opening Pandora's box, and I'm not all for it. So, Mayor, I am completely finished at this point. Anyone else? Uh, again, I understand it because uh, though they're exempt for the roads that go out to West Village, they may end up going somewhere else, or they might want to unload a load of dirt somewhere, and they traverse uh, our streets trying to get to that. They go off of 41 and head down Toledo Blade, because it's a shortcut or something. So I understand making the leeway for, for that developer for that location. Um, so I think the best plan is to actually have that traffic map done. Um, when this should be implemented, um, obviously you guys brought it forward for a reason. Can we have an understanding of why this is before us right now? Yes, ma'am. We have had requests um, in the past from commercial developers. Uh, I believe one was granted uh, many years ago uh, to the Atlanta Braves. And we have had a recent request by Publix um, and um, the city manager, former city manager Lear consulted with the city attorney. And the city attorney advised that the ordinance did not contain provisions to grant exceptions and that 
the recommendation was to amend the code to have criteria in there and also for, for a waiver process and for a waiver approval process. So that's why we're here before you this evening. Okay, were those exceptions made in the past without it being codified? Yes, I see the head shaking. Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, so this, this I is... I believe the answer is yes and no. Okay. I think that there... I, I have heard that there was one um, before my time here. There was one that was brought to me for review that was not allowed because the, the code does not provide for a waiver of the fee. It assesses the fee. I, I appreciate your protectiveness for us. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, if there's no other discussion, is there somebody who would like to make a motion on make this motion. ordinance? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I'll make a motion to direct staff to come back for first reading with fees and... First or second reading? First reading for directing about the fees for discussion um, to increase the fees. If City Attorney, I'll, I'll wait. She put a light on. So this is first reading. Mm -hmm. um, we can't have a second first reading. Okay. So uh, depending on what your motion is, the title of this motion would include a change to fees. We would not have to change the title. Uh, I'm sorry, of the, of the ordinance. We would not have to change the ordinance title in order to modify the fees. Okay, Mayor, excuse me. Um, it's not just as easy as staff looking at the fees and just kind of deciding what they should be raised to. Uh, we'd have to do a study. Yeah, we, we just couldn't, whether it's internal or our getting a consultant to assist us, we, we would have to have a basis for it, and that would mean we'd have to study. We'd have to update the 2006 study. We just can't, you know, come up with fees that easily. So is the 50 cent and 75 cent within this ordinance? Because it's, yes, talked, about, it's talked about yes, it in another ordinance. Yes, ma'am. The current ordinance. fees are in the ordinance, and that's what we're currently charging. Yes, ma'am. So when we have a study and mm -hmm. the fees are raised, we're going to have to bring this back to change it also because it's not really referring anything else. It's actually listing. You are correct. Charge. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So what you're desiring is that we make this provision so that we are properly doing what we're supposed to be doing. And then you will have some type of study. Yes, ma'am. So that both items, both ordinances can be brought back and change the amounts. Uh, city attorney, go ahead. I, I think that is one way to do it. I think based on her comments, what the commissioner was referring to, and I have not reviewed this, I don't know if, you're, if the city manager and her staff have had a chance to review this, but if Commissioner McDowell is accurate that the current study allows higher fees than what we're that's, charging, that's what I, I think that's, you know, if that's accurate, then we potentially could raise the fees without a study, but we would need to look at that and, and verify that. Correct. And that would, instead of a new study, it would be studying the study. <laughs> well, the, the other thing, if, if I may, um, although a consultant has made the recommendation for those fees based on their study, um, and we'd have to research this, the commission at the time may have opted to make the rates lower. Mm -hmm. My point is, uh, I would not just like to study the study. I believe we need to create a new study because a lot has changed in 14 years. So we either need to perform that study in-house or we will need to contract it out. Uh, and I, I appreciate those statements, but it's not in the budget this year. No, ma'am. So I believe it's something that would have to be done in-house. All right. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, your light is still on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, According to the study that was done in 2006, it was their recommendation to go up to the 146 for single family and 208 for commercial. Um, because this study has already been ad adopted, um, has already been approved, I would assume, it's already approved because we, because of this study, we instituted a rehabilitation fee program 
for the roads. So they had to have adopted the, fitty, the, the, the study to uh, come up with these fees. City Attorney, can we then go to the levels that were recommended in the study of 2006? Sounds like an impact fee study. <laughs> Well, these are these are not impact fees. I want to I know, be but it sounds like clear. the same topic, and it's it's different than mobility fees. And the Icon City Manager is is correct that you want to rely on studies that are that are current. In the absence of another study, if this is what the commission has approved, typically, just like our impact fee study is a bit old, mm -hmm. typically you still rely on on the existing study. Thank you. So I will go ahead and make a motion. Um, if you're ready, Mayor. Comment. They'll have. Somebody yeah. with a light on. I, I was just going on. to suggest that we decouple the two issues. I'm seeing two different decisions. One is moving ahead on the process and the templates for managing these kinds of requests. And the second is taking a fresh look and updating what that fee structure should be. Um, so I don't know if that's a motion you might have to direct me, but I would suggest that we decouple um, those two items. I was going to I appreciate that. So with that, if you have a motion. Um, well, I can't support the waiver, so I can't make a motion about the, the way that this ordinance is presented. I cannot support a waiver. Well, I'll make a motion. Okay. That's why I couldn't do that. <laughs> and, and since we are talking about separating them, yeah. this is why I'm going this route. Okay. Move to continue ordinance number 2020 40 to second reading on December 8, 2020, to include upgrading the definition of the multifamily mobile home park to where it is more understandable in, in, uh, <laughs> in the text. That's it. Motion on the floor. Do I have a second? I would second that. Okay. Uh, we have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor Emmerich, seconded by Commissioner Langdon to, um, to move. Uh, is it move? No. To continue. To continue. Thank you. I, was, I lost the word. To continue uh, for a second reading ordinance number 2020 40 and then reevaluating the wording of the definition of multifamily residential units. Anything to that? Nope. Anything to that? I'm good. Anything by anyone else? I was just going to add that uh, I will reiterate this is opening a Pandora's box and I don't see how you can even begin to possibly enforce where a truck is going throughout the city. Even if it's on an approved route and which trucks and all that, it's creating bigger problems. Uh, I'll, so I'll speak to this. that. It's, that's pretty much like most everything that we have. And it's the citizens. I mean, if somebody cuts down a tree on the weekend, it's the citizens who report it. Uh, the, the stuff that was going on with the dirt out in uh, Grand Paradiso, it was reported by citizens. So that's pretty much how we get alerted. Uh, I'm not one who says I don't put a rule in because it's difficult to enforce. I like to set the standard and request that that standard be met. All right, anything else? All right, then we will call the vote. And that passes three to two. Uh, Commissioner McDowell? Anything the reason for my dissension is the waiver and also that the fees are currently in place based on this ordinance and I could never agree to these fees the way that they are stated in the ordinance. That may change with the next motion, but as the motion read, I could not support it. Commissioner Iannotti, do you have a reason for dissenting? I don't believe the proposal I don't believe the proposal illustrates a reason for the waiver, nor does it um, include a way to enforce it. Um, poorly worded, poorly written, and yeah, I can't support it, and I think it's disappointing. It's, um, if you have a reason for not paying your fair share uh, on the roads, then that would make sense, but I don't, I don't see that here. I'm not convinced in any way. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, clerk's office, did you get all of that? Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, your light is on. Um, if you're ready, I'll make a second motion. Please do. Make a motion to increase the fees in ordinance number 2020-40 to be at the recommended amount from the 2006 study for residential being $1.46 per square foot of the all structures and the commercial slash mobile home or multifamily, I'm sorry, of uh, $2.08 per square foot of all structures. There is a motion on the floor in regards to upping the fees for this um, non-residential commercial areas for construction, making the residential, clerk, what was the amount? I need the number again, just for the residential. Residential is $1.46 for all structures. And then com <coughs> commercial <coughs> is 208. 208 for commercial. Is there a second to that? <coughs> Not hearing a second, uh, that motion fails. Is there anybody else who'd like to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we study what the impact fee or not impact fee, the road rehabilitation fee should be based on square footage. Um, I think tripling it um, without having the time to look at it is just uh, wouldn't be a responsible way to do it. So we have a motion on the floor to take to have a study done as to what the fees should be for the road rehabilitation um, fees. Or can we have a commission workshop? Let's let's tackle the motion okay. first. Uh, do I have a second to that? I would second that. Okay. Uh, we have a motion by Commissioner Iannotti uh, to, as I stated before, study uh, the rehabilita road rehabilitation fee to come back, seconded by Commissioner Langdon. Anything to that, sir? Already stated it. Uh, Commissioner Langdon, you're good. All right. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, your light is on. Um, I am all for having the study to increase it. Um, but the problem is we, excuse me, we do not have any funding in place to do another study. And the study can be, you know, what, 20, 50, I'm, I'm grasping at numbers, $1,000. Um, I, I, I think that would be something we would have to look at next year and put it in the budget and, I, I would welcome the opportunity to find a compromise, um, but I'm all for the fee study. We just don't have it in the budget for this year. So go ahead, Acting City Manager. Perhaps if I can suggest during our budget planning process, we could include it for 2022 fiscal year. Can I speak to this? Mm -hmm. Please. Um, <laughs> I don't see any reason why we have to have a formal study or pay anyone. This is our job. Um, we can do this in a commission workshop. This is what we are paid to do. Uh, there's no reason for there to be a study. Um, I do not believe everybody sitting here has read that 2006 report. I know the firms out of Arizona, I read some of it. So I think to just dismiss the idea that we all be better versed in what we're talking about doesn't really make any sense. So again, my motion is that the commission have a workshop to look at where we should set road rehabilitation fees. All right, uh, he's added something yeah. to <laughs> it. So, I mean, we can do an amendment or we can have an outright another motion after this one to set a workshop, um, but go ahead. Yeah, I sort of had a comment before the motion. I had my light on. Um, and I also was going to question the need to go outside for a study. I think we have very capable and competent staff who can take a look at those numbers, take a look at how it impacts um, 
uh, our complete sort of tax structure for our commercial developers uh, and bring back recommendations. So I don't know if, I don't know that we need a workshop. Um, I'd look for some guidance from acting city manager. Is this something that you feel comfortable that staff could look at and come back with a proposal? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can do it in house. Uh, unfortunately, right now uh, we have uh, a vacant position for our engineering division manager. Uh, we do not have currently on staff uh, the expertise. However, we are in the process of filling that position. So I would just, if, if I may, ask for a little bit of time, um, you know, not, like for example, six months. Give us six months to uh, get an engineering division manager on board that has traffic engineering knowledge and experience, and then we can perform that study appropriately. Mr. McDowell, your light is on. <laughs> Formulating words. With all due respect, we have been told in the past that staff could do something in house. Six months later, we find out hey, this is a little bit more in depth and a little bit more, we need to hire a professional to do this. So then it's six months later and I can give you multiple scenarios where that has come down. And I am afraid that this is going to be another one of those. If we could have done it in house, I don't know, I wasn't here in 2006. Uh, why we didn't do it in, in house in 2006, I don't know. What does state statute say with increasing a fee, because I know you have to have a study for impact fees, and I know this isn't an impact fee. I get it. Um, but if you're increasing fees, state statute says you have to hire an outside source. So I, I am very hesitant that in six months, it'll come back and say, hey, we got to get somebody from outside to do this. So I, I'm just throwing out past history because it unfortunately tends to repeat itself. And that, that concerns me, um, so. Acting city manager, your light's on. Yes, ma'am, we can, we can perform this study in-house. I just need a little time to get the appropriate staff in, in place. We will not need to contract it out. Commissioner Iannotti, you have the floor. Uh, city attorney, are we legally required to outsource a study for road rehabilitation fees? But that's something that we have not looked into. I'm not aware of a requirement to do that, but we've not looked into that. Is there any further discussion on that motion? City Clerk, would you read back to us what that motion was by Commissioner Iannotti, please? To study the road rehabilitation fee based on square footage. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, I see your light on. I'll make an amendment, Mayor. Okay. I'll make an amendment that the in-house staff conduct this study um, to be completed in fiscal year 2022, 2022. An amendment is on the floor to put a time frame of the entire fiscal year of 2021. Before, I'm sorry, before fiscal year 2022. Or fiscal year yes. 2022, that this um, study be done and brought back to the commission. Is there a second to that? I, I just nope. have a question. I'm tempted to second that. You can second for discussion. Okay, so let me second to discussion. Um, I just want to make sure, acting city manager, that you're comfortable with that time frame, given that you're still in the hiring process. Yes, ma'am. So as I understand it, it will be uh, prior to fiscal year 2022. So it'll be no later than September 30th of 2021. 2021. Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm comfortable. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and, and speak. Uh, I want this done sooner rather than later, personally, myself. Uh, over and over, this ordinance reiterated that we are not making the money that we need to. Uh, with the options that are in front of us, we have the ability, it appears, to do something about that. Uh, it takes an overview or a study in order to do that. Uh, I think six months should be tops. 
uh, that six months would bring it back at the point where we're talking about the budget for 2022. So I would rather see it put on that six month mark to come back to us, whether it's in you know a meeting or whether it's in a workshop. I think we can probably determine at that time with a memo or that, but I would rather see a six month time frame be put on it than September 30. I'll be happy to change it if my seconder is willing to do a, a friendly change to that, to have it done in six months instead of. Yeah, I would second that, uh, uh, but I, I look to acting city manager to say that six months is a feasible time frame. Yes, ma'am. Six months is feasible time frame. Okay, you have my second. Thank you. All right, we have an amendment on the uh, motion to put a time frame of six months to bring back um, a review study of the road rehabilitation bond, or excuse me, fee. In-house staff, you're forgetting With, that. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> With it being done in-house. Anything to that motion maker? No, thank you. Thing to that seconder? Good. All right, let's go ahead and vote on the amendment, placing that six month time frame in house. The amendment passes five to zero. Uh, we now go on to the main motion as amended. calling for the study to be done. And that also passes five to zero. Mayor, can I make another motion, please? Certainly. I'm all about compromise and six months is a long time and then we have to come back with a new ordinance to change those fees and everything. So you're looking at at least nine months. That's a lot of money being left on the table for fixing our roads. So I, I would like to make a motion to have the increase in fees be for residential to $1 per square foot of all, um, all structures and the commercial be $1.50 per square foot of all structures. That's basically meeting in the middle from where we are now to what was actually recommended in 2006. All right, there's a motion on the floor to increase the rate for the road rehabilitation fee for residential to $1, $1.50 for commercial. Is there a second to that? Hearing no second, um, that motion fails. And I'll state the reason that I didn't second it was because it had been stated that a study or a review needed to be done before we really altered it. All right, so that is the end of first reading. Um, what time is it? Okay, good. Uh, let's go ahead with the resolution. City Clerk, would you read that by title only, please? Resolution number 2020-31, a resolution of the City of Northport, Florida, identifying an inventory list of city-owned real property sites that are appropriate for use as affordable housing sites, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much. Uh, Acting City Manager, I can call on you to introduce this, but this was also stated to me um, by the city attorney in my one-on-one -on -one that what this is actually doing. It is reinstating, because we're, well, city attorney, I'll let you tell it, the three-year story. <laughs> sure, Mayor, Florida statutes requires that the city um, every three years update its list of city-owned properties that are designated for use as affordable housing. And in reviewing um, the history that has been done every year since the statute was passed, but it seems that in 2019 that was not done. So it needs to be done now to, com to comply with state law. Now, what properties you want to designate 
obviously are up to you, but the properties that staff has presented are there in the resolution. Thank you very much. Yeah, the properties that are in here are already listed uh, under the affordable housing of what we already have established. There is a lot larger conversation coming in the future on this, on the city owned lots. Um, but this was coming before us so that we are properly obeying the <coughs> state law. Uh, acting city manager, go ahead. You have staff in front yes, of you, so. Um, you. I would like to ask uh, Mr. Cole Gellhaus, the planning division, man planning division manager, to please provide a presentation. Good evening, for the record, Nicole Gailhouse, planning manager. Um, so as was stated by the city attorney, um, this ordinance is, or the resolution is to um, meet the requirements of Florida statutes to provide an inventory list of all real property um, that's appropriate for use as affordable housing. Um, this must be done every three years, and as stated by the attorney, we are a year overdue. Um, so we wanted to want to make sure that this moves, moves forward so we're in compliance with that statute. Um, the resolution as presented removed one lot that um, the adjacent property owner uh, is requesting to purchase um, and leaves the remaining 10 lots that were on the 2016 resolution. Um, staff has also identified 17 lots that are labeled surplus within the city owned properties that could be added to this list. However, there's some potential um, conflict and interaction with the um, other, with the other Commission direction um, regarding how to manage these properties. Florida statutes identifies four ways in which um, the lots designated for affordable housing may be used. Um, the first is to be offered for sale and the proceeds can be used to purchase land for the I'm having trouble talking today. Um, for the development of affordable housing or to increase the local government fund. Uh, they may be sold with a restriction that requires the development of permanent affordable housing. They may be donated to a nonprofit for the construction of permanent affordable housing or otherwise be made available uh, for production and preservation of permanent affordable housing. Um, a formal process for utilizing these lots is um, in the works but has not yet been completed. Um, the, we've had minimal interest in these. I've gotten, I think, maybe two or three requests over the time that I've been here, um, and they've never really come to fruition. And we don't have any record um, of anything coming to fruition on, on these lots. Uh, so um, we're requesting direction on the inclusion of the additional lots moving forward, as well as establishing how they should be used. Um, so we have two options presented right now. Staff's recommendation is to include the additional lots um, and to offer the lots for sale. Um, this kind of compromises with the, the commission direction to be able to offer these lots to the neighboring property owners. It would follow whatever procedure is established. The only difference is that the funds would be earmarked for the purpose of affordable housing. Um, and the idea would that this would create a separate fund that could be used um, to provide a local government match similar to what the agenda item we um, approved at the last commission meeting for the um, affordable housing project off Toledo Blade and Citizens Parkway. Um, so this kind of blends those two. Um, and if this is the option you choose to go with, we recommend um, including the lots that are in attachment to um, of the agenda item. Uh, you could also um, utilize the, the lots in other ways. There's nothing that restricts the city from um, using these lots in multiple ways. So if you choose to allow them for sale and for those funds to go to, to a fund for a local match, it doesn't stop you from also allowing them to be donated to a nonprofit for the construction of homes. Um, the other option is to adopt the resolution as presented, and then no further action would be taken until the full procedures and discussion on city owned lots um, is brought forward. And I'm here for questions. I, I, I appreciate that, um, and that you put both of those down because we don't even have a process brought to us. Mm -hmm. This was. December of 2019 or something, we asked for a process to sell the lots and it's never been brought forward. So I don't know how we can be linking anything personally myself when we don't even have that. Um, so I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, any questions? All right. 
Commissioner McDowell. Well, I'll pick up your baton then. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> so we gave direction back in December of 2019, as mayor stated, and the last update that we received from staff was in May of 2020, we would have the discussion on the possible sales swap uh, of how this would work, this process. That was supposed to happen in May. I understand COVID, that's the excuse of 2020, I get it. But we have Zoom meetings, we have other things we can do, and I know the city attorney is inundated up to her eyeballs and beyond in trying to get things done. But we haven't even gotten an update. The last one said that we would have had the discussion in May. The whole purpose of the city manager's thing is to keep us updated. So when are we going to have the discussion on this process for city-owned lots? Commission Kerry Branco, Assistant City Manager, for the record. Um, right now, that procedure is in the process of being finalized. Um, I'll have to go back to look to see what the update said in May. There were a couple items that still had to get finalized before the procedures could get written that required legal review. That also required our consultant, a real estate consultant, to look at. Um, so right now, the direction that was given on December 5th, 2019 was to come back with procedures and guidelines on how to dispose of surplus properties to include swapping, donation, and I've also included um, acquiring property. So um, to provide just an update about the very last steps with finalizing it, and then I'll be submitting it for legal review. Hope to get that done in early December. And... Uh, that is the status on for this procedure. An acting city manager, and if I need to get a consensus, I don't know how this would work, but six months to get an update on a, on a commission directive is really a long time. Um, and I, I would hope that after this meeting, um, all of the directives will be looked at to make sure that they, we are timely notified as to where we are in things. Because this one, has been sitting on that burner for well over six months without even getting an update. So, appreciate it. Do you have anything further? Um, the only other question is something I can just send in an email, so thank you. Does anybody else have a question or comment? Uh, my comment is, again, uh, we're out of compliance with state statute. To me, it's a no-brainer that this resolution be passed so that we are in compliance with the state. When this other topic comes forward in regards to the surplus lots, we'll address however we want to change anything at that point in time. But to me, get ourselves straight with the state. If there's no other questions or comments, Mayor, I'll go ahead and make a motion. Please do make a motion to approve resolution number 2020-R-31 as presented. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we have a motion on the floor to approve resolution number 2020-31 by uh, Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Commissioner Iannotti. Anything to that motion maker? No, I um, would have to also just hope that staff will take a look at all those state, other state statutes that we have to make sure that we're in compliance with and make sure we're in, actually in compliance. Um, I don't know how this one fell through the cracks, but it did, and hopefully this will be rectified. Mayor, I do have public comment on this I was one. just going to ask <laughs> after I had him okay. before we took the vote, I was going to ask you. Uh, so hold up just one second. Do you have any comments to it, uh, Commissioner Iannotti? I do not. Okay, a public comment, please. Okay, it's from Mildred Hubbard. Any lots currently owned by the City of Northport should be donated to the Environmental Conserv Conservancy of the City of Northport to be retained as green space and for wildlife habitat. They are a community-based 501c3 and deserve our support. The City of Northport cur currently has developers building several affordable housing complexes in addition to the ones we already have in the city. I don't feel that we need to donate any available lots for more affordable housing. We need to maintain green space and wildlife habitat. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, that is a great organization. Love them. All right. Uh, without further ado, we will call the vote.
and that resolution passes five to zero. So we are in compliance with the state. Let's take a 10 minute break, okay? And come back and finish the rest of the agenda. Is that fine with you guys? Ten minutes. All right, 10 minutes.
It is 7.45 and I call this meeting back to order and we are on to 6B. We're on 6B. Uh, Acting City Manager, I didn't know if you want to say anything. I know I'm the one that put this on the agenda. So I didn't know if you wanted to speak to it. No, ma'am, I didn't have okay. anything to say. Thank you. Uh, there, there are, I've got two cards on this agenda item. So I'm going to allow them to speak first. Uh, Jeffrey Scott, followed by Jacqueline Moore, please. I would like to remind the Northport electorate, our city commission has created their own quagmire. Our commissioners and public administration have abandoned the rule of law, and as a result, we have become pure pawns in the scheme of things. Since 2016, Northport residents have witnessed that misconduct and dishonesty does in fact pay, especially at the local level of government. Our city government has indeed overstepped their civic duty and squandered the trust of the Northport taxpayer. We cannot continue on a path that is based on the abandonment of the rule of law. Our city government has created their own quagmire and its legitimacy moving forward is as desperate as it is ordinary. And I thank you for the time. Thank you, sir. Past Commissioner Moore. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. I'm Jacqueline Moore, very proud Northport resident and leadership advisor and civility trainer. So when I saw this item on the agenda, I was so excited and I'm not surprised. I'm so optimistic to see what you all are going to do to help lead us into really all new, all new territory. So I just wanted to offer a couple of nuggets for you to have in your mental hopper when you start talking about this item. And I don't have it in front of me, but I didn't hear the item read. Could somebody just read the name of the item? Was it read? Civility and professionalism. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to say that um, one thing that makes our city very special is that we founded a kindness community in 2017. So when I saw this on the agenda, it felt like a next step, especially with new leadership in place now to begin a process, which I believe is your intention, Mayor Luke and, and your colleagues, not just a one-off where we're going to talk about it tonight, but really a process that helps us continue to all move forward um, as a city. So um, with my experience and my passion, I wanted to share just a couple of nuggets for you all to have in mind when you delve into this tonight and going forward. We've learned through decades of work in the field that there are really four skills that under, um, undergird or under um, score our ability to choose civility. You know, kindness is part of it, professionalism is part of it, but in decades of experience, we've learned that there are four skills, and maybe at a workshop or something at some point, if it serves you, I would love to come and give more depth around this, but three minutes isn't very long. <laughs> so the first one is continuous learning. The second is social intelligence. The third is systems thinking, and the fourth is cultural competence. So just put those in your hopper and maybe we can talk more. The last is to call your attention to a 2013 study that management researchers Poreth and Pearson did that were published in the Harvard Business Review. And it shared data and study about the price of incivility. So as you go forward and you aspire to create even greater levels of collaboration and civility throughout everywhere, because as I know you know, you set the tone. You create the culture. Your behavior on the dais, your behavior in representing us anywhere and everywhere, really sends the signal and the message to everyone about how we behave and what's really acceptable here in Northport. <clears throat> the most significant findings I want you to think about, 38% of the respondents said when they observed or experienced incivility, they intentionally decreased work quality. 78% in the study said their commitment to the organization declined. So leadership sets the tone. Everyone watches that to take cues, not all consciously, somewhat unconsciously. You know, we're all processing a lot of things. But you have, as I know you know, and I say with great 
um, uh, affection and great support and great encouragement. You have a tremendous responsibility, not just to do all the hard work you already did on everything you've done tonight of that kind, but also to really take this um, and continue to run with it in ways. And I look forward to serving in any way I can. And thank you for your time and blessings of Thanksgiving to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, th this uh, item was put on by me. Uh, it's, uh, this is just to discuss what uh, I would like to see done as a chair and get the input from the commissioners so that we have an agreement of how we handle ourselves up here. Uh, again, this um, booklet that Assistant Yarborough uh, put out, it says, members of the governing body set the standard for civility and decorum at a meeting by modeling expected behavior. You can't challenge or reprimand a disruptive citizen if disruption and personal attacks are common among governing body members. Uh, so that brought to focus um, some things that I wanted to, to talk about. Uh, we, as a past commission, kind of threw out the window what a consensus really is. And a consensus is an agreement that we collaboratively agree on, and it's not a vote. And we've gotten away from that, and we go with this majority uh, on a consensus all the time. When actually, if there's not a unanimous decision, it should be put on an agenda item and come back and discuss so that the public has an opinion and we actually can take a full vote, not claiming that is you know, a consensus by just being the majority. Uh, if you look any that definition up in any book, it states that, that that is um, what a consensus is. Now, there are some times where we can't, and that basically deals with the budget. We have uh, budget hearings, and we're having to make that decision right at that point in time. So in those workshops you know, that deal with budget or meetings that deal with budget, I see that as being an exception. But I would like uh, this item discussed among the commissioners to see if they're in agreement with me that we can agree that consensus in our meeting is unanimous or it's brought back for a full discussion. Anybody have comments? Go ahead, Commissioner McDowell. You don't have to put a light on. You guys can just interject if you want to. I always would prefer to be called on that way, then I, I don't interrupt anybody, but it's your way. Well, my, my little thing went crazy, so <laughs> go ahead. The only time, like we had a consensus tonight and it was on a related item. Um, it was unanimous. And, and it was unanimous, but if it, if it was not unanimous, I don't think it would come back for discussion anyways. Um, I, I don't see how sometimes things, it, it's that discussion item, and if you're going to get a consensus and it's not unanimous, you're not going to have a separate conversation on that one specific thing. Hey, let's get a memo for whatever. If it's not unanimous, or if it's if it's not majority, you're not going to have another discussion about that little tidbit of information. Do you, do you see what I'm, I, I'm trying I see, to spit I see out? What it's you're not, saying, but it's you would not, have the right to do that if you wanted to in a full discussion. If it didn't go, well, if I wanted to, I could definitely create an agenda item. Right. Absolutely. Right, but to to just assume that if something was let's say a four to one on consensus that it would automatically be placed on an agenda item, I don't think that that would be accurate. I think it would have to be that person if they're that passionate about it to create an agenda item. But sometimes those kind of consensus is like, hey, we want a memo. Maybe somebody doesn't want a memo on that item. You know that, and some things are more consensus and majority of it rules, but then there's other items that are very, very detailed and very, very um, 
needing to be on the agenda that is a consensus item that has been taken in the past. And that I agree Correct. should have been multiple times, should have been actual agenda items because action was actually taken. To me, consensus exactly. are little things, not discussion items. The items, right. Anybody else? Um, Commissioner Langdon. Yeah. Um, it's interesting when I read this agenda item, I went in a totally different direction um, with my thinking. And for me, um, my thinking is more along the lines of some of the public comments. And Excuse me, Commissioner, can you put your microphone on, please? Thank you. Oh, my goodness. I That's promise great. by the next meeting I will have this down, okay? That's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I was saying, when I read this agenda item, my thinking went in a totally different direction. I, I wasn't sort of thinking about voting and consensus. I was thinking about our behavior and decorum um, and not just in public meetings. One of the things that really settled on me um, in assuming this chair is the fact that I was elected to this office. And ready or not, I represent the city of Northport 24 hours a day and seven days a week. And with that frame of reference, everything that I do, not just in this meeting, but when I'm at Publix or um, when I'm on social media, um, I sort of expect a certain level of decorum and behavior. And I think this is a really important topic. Um, a few months ago, I actually did a little bit of research around did other cities have codes of behavior um, for their elected officials? And many do. Um, few have guidance. In fact, I didn't see any that had guidance around how elected officials should conduct themselves, particularly on social media, because it's relatively new. So I think this is a very, very important topic for this commission. Um, and I would love to have the opportunity, perhaps in a retreat or in that kind of forum, for us to flesh out this agenda yeah. um, and have some really <coughs> in-depth discussions. And we had, um, uh, we've got another meeting coming up where the decorum of the public meeting is being addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, city attorney and city clerk are working on it. So I wasn't trying to bring in that type of discussion, mm -hmm. but usually when you have a chair come into position, we talk about what we as a commission, how we want to conduct ourselves in right. our meetings, because it's us first. You know, we handle right. ourselves before we can do anything, you know, with the public. So, um, so I've got a list of things that I wanted to bring up, and that first one was the consensus because we have not been doing it properly, and so I was wanting some feedback um, how you how you guys see it. If you want to uh, have these uh, consensus be unanimous, unless it deals with the budget, or I mean. I personally don't like using it as a vote because it's not. And you open this Pandora box of doing something that the citizens haven't even been able to speak on or be addressed on. And um, so uh, to me, it needs to be unanimous. Vice Mayor, you got anything? I'm still thinking, but yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. And we have gone through that process quite often. And, and it does take away the citizen's voice. Um, I, I would agree that it needs to be unanimous and maybe even downsize it a little bit to where it does pertain to like memos and just little tidbits of work between staff and the commission and not nothing that, that has to do with the public. So I'm, I'm sort of on the fence on a lot of things here, but I agree with you, you know, wholeheartedly that we have gotten into that practice and 
You can even ask the attorney and staff, well, a consensus here, consensus there. You hear it all the time, and it piles them up on work, too. Exactly. So I, I, I'm in agreement with you. I think we need to curb that type of practice. Ionati, anything? I guess I'm a little confused as to what process we're referring to and if it's, you know, binding in any way. Uh, the consensus is. Uh, and um, we got away from, I mean, the previous commission before us, they held fast that a consensus was unanimous. When this current commission, or not this one, but the one that just left, uh, cast that aside and said, no, it's the majority rules. Well, when a majority rules, that's a vote. That's not a consensus. A consensus is an agreement. And as I said, you can Google it, look it up. That's the definition. City Clerk, do you have any input on that? I do. Um, per Robert's rule, um, just in case any of you aren't aware, the consensus is supposed to be on items that you feel are going to require little conversation and of little importance is what it says. So it would be on you know, consensus to reorder the agenda or consensus to hear public additional public comment, things like that. Um, if you're not able to get consensus, you can vote on, then what, what you would do is you would turn it into a vote. Mm -hmm. The mayor would say, okay, do I have a vote then? And then there would be discussion. Consensus is for little discussion. I think that there's also the, what I've seen a lot is items that are not on the agenda, yes. that discussion comes up and then there's consensus to do something with that item, which I think is more of what the mayor's talking exactly. about. Then exactly. there's a difference in the consensus with the things that are already on the agenda or routine procedures versus stuff coming up in commission comments at the end. Well, can we have an agreement that the work that the clerk and the attorney is doing that they word somehow because the consensus, the way that Robert's Rules discusses it, be added to that as they bring that back. Go ahead, Commissioner Mc. Oh, uh, city Attorney first. Well, I I put my line on to follow up with the city clerk reference because if this is what we were talking about. I would like to urge all commissioners to put your items on the agenda rather than bringing them up. Um, you know, spur of the moment in your commissioner comments. We want to provide for full public notice of all of the processes, even if the item is going to be coming back before the commission for a full vote. The public will not have had, you know, the benefit of knowing in advance in order to participate either by listening or by commenting on your thought process that you put forward in this discussion to formulate the consensus. So I just want to urge you all to think about that. You know, each one of you can put something on an agenda just by emailing your city manager in a timely fashion according to the code. Commissioner McDowell. It was my understanding that consensus um, was meant for the little things. Uh, and, and during my commission comments, I'm going to have to get consensuses on very little housekeeping type of things. Um, using the memo, for example, if the direct city manager to provide a memo for, and it was a four to one vote, that's not a consensus. So then it would become, okay, I make a motion to direct city manager. And this is on agenda items only because that's usually when we do these consensuses, these little things in between a, a discussion item. Um, when we say, hey, we want a memo on, and if it's four to one, then it goes, I'll make a motion then, Mayor, and then it becomes a formal vote as opposed to consensus. And, th and that is fine with me. I just don't like seeing a consensus act as a vote. Absolutely. If it's not, and it's, a consensus isn't supposed to be a big discussion item that isn't noticed properly. Um, Correct. And, and, it becomes this gray area. And I, I think at this point, you know, maybe city manager, I'm sorry, city attorney and city clerk can go, hey, guys, wait a minute, this isn't noticed in the, on the agenda. We can't be discussing it. And then we can go, okay, let's get a consensus to put it on the next agenda. 
with with all due respect, Commissioner, that has not worked in the past. And you know, our my, my job is not to police you all. I have I many times talked to the commission about putting these items, you know, on the agenda while you're discussing them, only then for a consensus to to follow the advice. I know. That is why I wanted to bring this up so that we are in agreement as we start this year out that we do want that. That is how we want to do it professionally. And if that means, you know, the city attorney or the city clerk clarifies something for us, we need to perk our ears up and realize that they're trying to lead us to that more professional manner. Keep us out of trouble. Exactly. Exactly. So can we come to an agreement on the consensus? Consensus on the consensus. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm asking for. I, I would need to know specifically what is it that you're looking for so that I, I can weigh in and, and, and cast my either affirmative or dissenting consensus vote, non-vote. Consensus non-vote. I mean, it, it can be explained later when the, the clerk and the attorney bring back their items so that we can see how it's worded through Robert's rule. Um, but we are talking about the small items, but we are talking amongst each other. And I think we have an understanding that we no longer want to use consensus in a wrong manner. And if I just get agreement to that, I would be thrilled. It doesn't even have to be uh, down, you know, written down, but to have everybody say, yes, we want to utilize the consensus properly. And if need be, we have an agenda item or we call for a vote instead of misusing a consensus. I am in agreement. Thank you, sir. I'm in agreement. I don't know how we're going to hold each other accountable when somebody's passionate about something, but that—that that is my job. That—that <laughs> that is my job. I know. Uh, as the chair, that is why I wanted us to discuss these things so that we have an agreement among each other, so that when I might have to say, "Hey, that's not a consensus. It was three to two, or whatever." Is there a vote? Do we need an agenda item? You'll have an understanding of why I'm stating that from the position that I'm in as chair. Okay? Are you I'm ready? in agreement. I, I have a question. Yes, um, what kind of impact might this have on the length of our meetings? Shorten it. Yeah. It would. Yes. Because you would bring it back as another agenda item in a future so it, day. It would stop going down a rat hole and pull us back, and right. then I'm all in. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Um, just opinion of how this meeting has gone with our questions. I know when staff gives a presentation, we're only supposed to be forming questions. Uh, there is some leniency, and I don't mind somebody um, making a statement along with their question, because I believe dialogue and discussion is very fruitful. I don't want to see somebody trying to persuade everybody else right out of the block of their way when it's question time. So just to give you, you guys give me your opinion. Was today okay in your mind because I gave leniency and didn't demand just questions. Was it all right in your mind? Sometimes it, and it even happened tonight because I know you have to ask questions first when we're having the discussion item. Sometimes it's, you, you gotta get out the words and then say, yes, I know I'm getting to the question. Sometimes that has to happen because if you just ask the question, it, there's no context behind it. So I, I I thought it went well today. I don't think that's really been an issue in the past with questions. Um, as long as people are actually getting to the question, I remember many times the mayor would say, you do have a question in there somewhere? Oh, yeah, 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 I'm getting to it. And then reeling them in to get to that point of the question. 
but there are many times where the question does require a little context behind it. One of the things that I'm not comfortable with on the dais is chastising staff. Um, and I would really like to see that behavior curtailed. That's in my last <laughs> no, point. <laughs> I'm trying to move through these meetings no, no, fastly now. No, no she's, <laughs> she's doing okay. Uh, so. I just had a comment on that as well, do. because sometimes when I ask questions, sometimes I give the reasonings why I'm asking that question, because I may have some background in that situation <laughs> from working here and stuff like that. And I just want to paint a whole picture. I'm not long-winded up there. I get to the point, I get right. it done, and then I move on, and then I leave the floor open for others. So, I mean, no, to your discretion, that is why you run the meeting. So everybody was all right? Um, Commissioner yeah, I just Hunter. wanted to add that I can certainly see the value in question time being for questions. Um, if you're going to make your point with your motion, then that makes sense as well. So I um, certainly appreciate what you're saying there and, and, and agree. Thank you very much. All right, um, going on to this one, and I'm going to have um, city clerk uh, talk about this one too. Um, motions should state the intent completely, uh, not giving room for misinterpretation or ambiguity. By doing this, we can avoid making so many amendments. We've gotten so that everything is amended, 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 and that takes even more time too. Um, city clerk, would you talk about motions, please? We just prefer them to be clear and concise. Um, it's easier for us if it's just the motion, not the whys in there, and then a conversation in the middle of it, and then come back to the motion later. Um, so that helps us on our end. Also, for amendment, <coughs> well, once your motion is stated, even if it's seconded, if the mayor has not announced the motion, it can be changed without making a motion to amend it. Amend it. So that can continue to happen until she restates the motion. So that would help with less amendments if you just change your restate your motion to what you'd like it to be. And that is uh, by the motioner. Yes. So if Commissioner Langdon made a motion, seconded by uh, Vice Mayor Amrich, um, somebody wants to interject something before I do it, she decides she wants to add that. Yes. So yes. is the motion. Okay. Uh, anybody have the problem with that? That's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay. Attorney. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to say for the benefit of our new board members who may already know this, but because we didn't cover it in your orientation, the official record of your direction are your minutes, and those are your motions and your consensus. So, um, you know, when we're reviewing something from a legal standpoint and we're looking for commission action, we, you know, I'm not interested in any of the discussion that's in the minutes. None of that is binding. That is just one person's thought at that moment. It is the action of the board, and that is captured in your motions. So there have been a lot of times, you know, where things have come back and members of the board have said, well, that's not what we meant. We don't know what you mean. Even if you talked about what you thought you meant, that doesn't mean it was what the board meant. We only know what's in the motion. So that's one thing that you may want to keep in mind with respect to the intent of your motions and the language of your motions to be as precise to reflect what you really want to happen coming back, because that's what we will, that's what we will be looking at. How... City, if I may. city clerk tickled me when she and I were going over these types of things. And she says, a motion should not include the word because. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Now, our, our, if we do something by consensus, is that also captured in the minutes the same way a motion exactly. would be? Exactly. Yep. It's okay. exactly what you say. All right. Uh, during the commission communications, and I know for the new ones, that is after pretty much all the work is done, um, and you get to articulate or talk about the things that you've done or blah, blah, blah. 
we're going to be having a discussion in a little bit about our assignments. And if you have a meeting uh, of that committee or that board that you sit on, please report that during your commission comment. Uh, we'd like to know what happened at that because you represent uh, the city on that board. So I would encourage you to do that, please. Um, Commissioner McDowell, I saw a light on with you. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the motion thing, as our new commissioners get comfortable making motions and understanding the um, clarity that a motion needs to be made, we may still have some amendments. That way then, you, it, it's a learning process for them. Yeah. And I, I still need it. I, I still... I'm, I'm somebody who, and I've done it when I filled in for you, I've done it tonight. I haven't read or I haven't reiterated it. Let's get the clarity to it. I've done it both times. And I like doing that rather than having an amendment because you go through all the voting, you go through all the explanations, and I'd rather wrap it up tight and have it done the first time. Um, if I can get an agreement with this, when a citizen comes up and makes a comment and there's going to be information gathered from that citizen. That citizen's information is then given to all commissioners, not one. So one commissioner doesn't, doesn't say, can I get their phone number, their contact, or whatever. It's for all of the commissioners, not just one. Can I have agreement with that? Is it... Okay. Yeah, I, most of the time that happens, I believe it's staff that they're getting the information and we don't get that information, but I agree. But it should, it should come to all five, not just one. Correct, right. correct. Okay. Absolutely. No, yeah. I, I agree. And I know that there's been multiple times that I have said, could I please have the citizens contact information because I would like to reach out to them. Right. But if other commissioners want that contact information, that's when they should say, hey, I want it too because I want to speak with Well, them. I would like to see it automatically given to all of them. If they want to get rid of that email or that contact, that's up to them. But it, it's almost close to a direction, almost. So I'd rather see it dispersed among all five to, to get away from looking like it's just being supplied to one. I mean, staff does a good job doing with our questions, sending them out to all five. So I'd like to see information from the citizens to be dispersed uh, among all of us too, and then you can do whatever you want to. Um, time limits for questions or discussion. Uh, I float around that 10 minute mark. It's not as though I'm gonna be, bam, you, you know, your 10 minutes is up. But um, I think 10 minutes is an adequate time per rotation that somebody have in questioning or comment. There can be second rounds, but I think 10 minutes of it, and I'm not going to be super strict with it, but you'll hear me say, you have another question? Are you about done? Something like that. Is that suffice the commission? The way that I look at it is if you have 10 minutes per commissioner, that could equal up to 50 minutes. And that's that's a good time limit. Now, if you go into the second round, I'd maybe cut it in half oh, and, yeah. do, and do five be, minutes. It's only you know, five. But you yeah, didn't so mention that. You were mentioning another 10. Well, and I'm that, hoping, hoping that she wants out of these meetings. So we got to <laughs> cut them back here a little bit. So, well, And that that is the aim to... It's your meeting, it, you control to it. To make it this way. But and, uh, just to give heads up, if somebody starts to go over that 10 minute mark, I'm probably going to say something about the, the length. Is that okay? I, I like that. Um, as most recently, having been simply a resident of Northport and trying to watch or participate in these meetings when they go on and on, it's really a detriment to citizen and resident involvement. Um, so I think a time limit is appropriate. It should not be a goal. It should clearly be a maximum um, and really probably strive for less in many situations. Well, we're, we're talking a meeting. I mean, workshops are different. I mean, mm -hmm. we schedule workshops right. so that we can sit down and hammer stuff out. Right. 
Uh, right. But in the meeting, that is what I'm talking about, meeting yep. time. All right. Um, this one is when a commissioner. Okay. You have a... I'm sorry. The only thing is, is there are some discussion items that do have a lot more questions and a lot more discussion than what the time limit is. And while I try very hard to be respectful with my questions, I always get with staff ahead of time. We are here to help the citizens. We are here to do a job. We cannot talk to each other about these discussion items prior to this meeting. That is probably the number one reason these meetings go so long because we have to vet everything right here. We can't vet it back there. We can't vet it out at the coffee shop. We can only vet these things here. And sometimes those questions, I'll ask a question and then they'll go, somebody else will then have another question on that one and another one on that one. So then it does become long because the, the phrase that I learned right away, it's making sausage. And I'm like, what the heck is that all about? What does that mean? It's because we have a job to do and we can only do it here. And sometimes those topics are going to take a little bit longer and question and answer time is going to take a little bit longer than what is desirable. But this is our job. We only meet today. And then we don't meet again until next Thursday. And each agenda is different. So I just want to throw it out there because then too, if you have a 10 minute limit and if sometimes it'll be strict, sometimes not, when it's your agenda item that you're passionate about, then that 10 minutes goes very quickly and you're not going to be able to get your points across and your questions because you have a time limit. We have a job to do. And, and I don't want that to be lost. Yeah, we, we can't lose that because it is the public meeting. Uh, city clerk? I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to assume this is probably the appropriate place to um, bring or time to bring this up and ask for a consensus <laughs> <laughs> to um, bring an item back to discuss the pre-agenda meetings. I have spoken with Carrie and um, about she presented it before and it was not approved and we'd like to bring that back. Um, Finance did a spreadsheet that they sent me and our city in 2019 spent 242 hours in commission meetings. The next highest one was 144 hours it's for the Palm Coast and, and below that all of them are less than 82. So I'll add that topic difference. to this then. Thank okay. you for bringing that forward. Uh, Commissioner Ionati. So, um, you know, I, I think you could make a convincing argument on both sides of this um, question. I think 10 minutes is an awfully long time to say anything. So I really, you know, and I, I'm not going to be wordy here because the point <laughs> is you really don't need to take, at some point you're talking to yourself if you're just constantly reiterating things. So... I think let's be succinct. Let's get to the point. Um, and, you know, the pre-agenda meetings is something that I have interest in because it speaks to preparation. I don't know of any other local government that has meetings that last six, eight hours like the city of Northport, and it's, um, it needs to change. Uh, the the 10-minute mark that I was talking about uh, as I said, it's not going to be this die-hard for me. Uh, when we, well, again, I'm going to say I'm thankful for the staff sending out the questions that each commissioner asks because it gives you that preparation ahead of time, too. Uh, but if it's a tough subject, we're going to know that we're going to need a little extra time. And we might do a third round instead of just a second or something. I mean, there's flexibility can come to this. It's not rigid, but I don't want it um, just going on and on without without legitimate reason. All right. The other uh, topic in regards to that area is, let's say, um, Commissioner McDowell is 
you talking to her questions, asking staff something, and Vice Mayor Emmerich, you know, ding, here, here this light bulb goes off, and he's got a question on the same topic. I have actually seen minutes state what the first commissioner was saying, and it might be inaccurate, and then the second commissioner, they wait their turn, and they make a statement, and it's the opposite, and the minutes are reflecting two different things on the same topic. I'm somebody, again, who likes to discuss. And so I don't have a problem with somebody raising their hand when they want to interject or have pose a question to what another commissioner topic is on. We've done that quite often by saying, can I, can I say something? Can I ask something? Back there, off of it. What's that? Piggyback off of exactly. it. Exactly. Some term like that. You know, you get the permission, it's still respectful, you're not interrupting them, you're signaling and stating something, but I would much rather get that topic discussed right then and there instead of it passing down everybody and then the same topic is talked again by the second round by the second commissioner. So I think it could enhance the discussion, make it more accurate, and more timely. Does anybody have any feedback on that? Well, the only thing I would look into, I, I firmly agree with that, but I, let's say uh, that scenario took place and Commissioner McDowell was asking questions, and then another commissioner jumps in there and asks a couple questions. You just got to make sure that Commissioner McDowell still has enough of her oh. remaining time left oh, because definitely. you're not going to, you yeah, know, well, as I said, I, I don't just have don't want to muddy the waters. <laughs> exactly. Right. I don't have a I just timer don't want to muddy the waters, but I would like to get the subject matter taken care of and be done with exactly. and then move on. Exactly. Any other comments on that? Huh? Uh, all right. To what you brought up and to what um, past Commissioner Moore was saying. I am somebody who I don't like negativity at all. And I don't like negativity to staff. I don't like negative comments to each other. I don't like negative comments to citizens. If there is any negativity in any of those directions, I'll pick the gavel up and I'll gavel it. Trust me, I want to say, 10 minutes in time out, but, <laughs> <laughs> but gavel it down and stop, you know, stop. Uh, I don't think somebody needs to be chewed out. I think if we having this discussion right now, you know, if the gavel goes down and I say stop, please be respectful to your commissioners, to whoever, you know, is of the public or the staff especially to yourself. If it continues on and there becomes all this hoofa going back and forth between each other, I'll gavel it down and we'll take a recess. If that doesn't settle it, I'll gavel it down and adjourn the meeting. But I think we can be respectful with one another and with our constituents, with our staff, with one another. And um, so that hopefully I don't ever have to do it one time this coming year. Any comments in regards to that? Understood. All right. Sounds good to me. Thank you, ma'am. Um, is that applying to when citizens are speaking, there are three minutes? No, nope, this is okay. us. I just wanted, I, I wanted to make nope. perfectly clear on that because this, I would have had a different comment. This is us. I mean, later when we talk about the decorum for the, you know, the public comment card and stuff like that, when the clerk and the attorney bring that back, that discussion happens. But to me, you get your own house in order first. You can't, as that booklet says, you can't, admonish somebody if you're doing if you're guilty of doing the same thing 
All right, so let's go into that pre-agenda meeting. Uh, City Clerk, you want to speak with that? And then we'll let uh, Commissioner Iannotti follow up with that. I was just asking for a consensus to bring it back as an agenda item to um, work with Carrie and present it, just get commission's input on it. Okay. Um, Commissioner Iannotti, do you have a comment on it? I would agree to that. That would be my only comment. Uh, my question would be, do we want to do this in a meeting, public meeting, or do we want this part of our uh, team building strategic planning? Because in those workshops, I mean, we're going to have strategic planning and we're going to have a team building, uh, what do they call it? Retreat. retreat. You have budgeted money for a retreat? It's been, been talked yeah. about. I asked about it. So whether it's done as an agenda item in a public meeting or whether we discuss it uh, in a retreat or strategic planning, up to you guys. My understanding was it had, it had to be a public meeting. Well, it always is a public meeting. Everything public we do. Meeting that. Yeah, I mean, if I could clarify, your, all of your retreats and all are also public. Yeah. But they are not right. meetings where decisions take place. Right. Uh, and the last time we discussed it was in our retreat. It was, I was in the Morgan Center when it was first brought up. Right, but then it came before the commission for a vote. Correct, correct. And it, it was agreed on over there and then shot down here. But I'm talking about the initial talk. Of course, it's going to have to be voted on. So my question is, do you want to do it sooner rather than later, or do you want to wait until the uh, retreat. I don't even know. When is the retreat? I, I was just going to say, we have no idea when a retreat is, and I don't remember seeing it in the budget. But um, I, I think a workshop, I mean, we got a workshop coming up. I, I, it's probably too late for December's workshop, but January's workshop, we just do something in January. Uh, my mind just turned, and these pre-agendas are actually publicized and public's able to come to them. Exactly. I think we need to. I don't know how it's going to save staff time, like everybody's thinking. If you're having a public meeting to talk about a pre agenda I know. and then have the, the actual meeting, I, 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 I think, I think I'm going to agree again. that this be on, uh, on one of our meetings here so that public can come give comment to could, it. Uh, could a pre agenda meeting not be time limited? Limited in time. From nine to ten, <coughs> one to four or three. Yeah, it generally is done that way. Yes. See, when I remember the discussion about pre agenda meetings, it was because staff time was being spent to go over with each commissioner the agenda items. I know I, for one, said, hey, I don't need an agenda meeting. That'll save y'all, you know, four hours a month on average. Um, and I haven't had an agenda meeting since. If I have questions, I send it to staff. Um, I don't know to have a meeting, to go over a meeting of the whole board when all of the charter officers and all of the staff has to be present. I don't know how effective that is where a pre-agenda meeting one-on-one -on -one is just with, unless it's changed, just with city attorney, city manager, and City manager and city attorney well, they and were gonna, one commissioner. They were going to bring in uh, more staff to these pre-agendas. But I think all you're requesting is a consensus to put it on an agenda, not really a discussion at this point. We can discuss it when it comes right. on the agenda. And I was suggesting okay. a workshop to have the discussion about pre-agenda meeting. It can be done, well... Workshop, you can't make a decision, but we can discuss it. But in a workshop, you can't make a, can't vote on it. So, um, you asked I mean, city manager. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, Assistant City Manager Yarbo has uh, done some, a little bit of research to try to schedule a team building session, perhaps in December, and a retreat in January. And what I was going to suggest is um, Assistant City Manager Branco had prepared a very uh, well, you know, well thought out, written research study on the uh, pre agenda. So perhaps we could have that either at a commission meeting or a commission workshop, um, or even discuss it at, at the team building session. Uh, that way we could go back over it and um, 
15 buildings in January, you said? I, he's trying to get it for December. December. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that myself. That's coming up real fast. All right. We're going to ask for a consensus for the city clerk that there be a discussion brought forward uh, for the commission to talk about pre-agenda meetings and it be done either in a public meeting or in our team building meeting. Commissioner Langton. I agree. I'm in agreement. I am. And Commissioner McDowell. Okay. You, you keep referring it to a public meeting or a team building meeting. Everything we do up here as a body is a public meeting. So what what do you mean by a public meeting versus the team building meeting? A regular scheduled commission meeting an agenda. versus versus okay. a workshop, which Thank would you. be so the you team wanted an building. agenda, an agenda at a commission meeting or at the team building. Yes. Thank you. I just needed that clarification. Okay. And Thank your you. your decision? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, you have your consensus, ma'am, and it is unanimous. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, is there anything else on this uh, subject before we leave it? Going, going, gone. All right. That takes care of B. We are on to C, which is um, discussion and possible action regarding approval of the districts and commission meeting schedule for 2021. Uh, City Clerk, would you go ahead and introduce... Yes, in your backup documentation, there was um, two sheets. One was for the commission um, regular meetings. You'll notice that the special meetings, the first Thursday, that was typically called a special meeting. I reworded it to a regular meeting because they are regularly scheduled. Um, and also, the, the schedule does accommodate the um, NLC. That's in March, so that was changed, and the meeting was going to be put for March 2nd, so that's already on there. There's no other conflicts. And then there is the um, the workshop schedule. Does anybody have a question or comment on this topic? Commissioner McDowell. The only thing I would like to add is sometime in August, pick a date. I don't care what date. Put in there for a placeholder for a special meeting. Um, we had to have one last year during because of budget talks. We're going from the last Tuesday in July to the first Tuesday in September. It's a very long time. There's sometimes things that staff needs to go over um, on an emergency basis. This way we have at least a placeholder for a special meeting um, that can be canceled if there's no need for it. But it's easier to put it on the calendar now than to try and find it 10 days before when they have to have the discussion. That's, that's the only reason why I was suggesting that. And I don't know as I have a 21 calendar here. Yeah, and, and I think staff can just pick a day and put it on there. Well, I think the, the beginning of the third week or whatever. If it's yeah, I have on here like August 16th or something yeah. like that because it's in the middle of the month. If we need it, on we a Monday. have it. I, I don't know. I just picked a date. And I don't even know if it's a weekday, August 16th. <laughs> Does anybody have a calendar for 21 and no? I'm sorry? I have one right here. Okay. August 16th is a Monday. It's the third Monday in August. That it's sounds... right smack in the middle of the month. Great to me. Does uh, anybody have an objection Thank for you. scheduling something on August 16th? That's a Monday. In the morning or nine at, o'clock, whatever. At 10 a.m., just in case we need to convene for something. Is there any objection to that? Thank you. Uh, anything else on this um, commission meeting draft? I would like to bring up the Thursday meeting. Uh, I, I appreciate her switching it from a special meeting to a regular meeting because that's what we've done with it. Mm -hmm. And it's an actual regular meeting. 
I, I mean, do we really want to continue holding one at 1 p.m. that first Thursday? Or shall we remove it and have the 4 o'clock for the uh, presentations, the proclamations, the, um, the awards? And if necessary, something could be scheduled. Any comments on that? And that seems reasonable to me. Because what we've done is planned for these first Thursdays at 1 o'clock. There's no pre-agenda meeting. There's no one-on-one. -on -one, and there's regular items discussed just like the first and, or excuse me, the second and the fourth Tuesdays. So if we're not going to treat it as though it's regular, even though we're scheduling it as though it's regular, I would rather just something special be called Commissioner McDowell. The only thing that I do remember in the past, if the Tuesday meeting is the last meeting of the month, and that goes from 6 p.m. until whatever time it ends, sometimes we run out of discussion time. It gets late, and we say, hey, we give direction for the city manager to add X, Y, and Z to Thursday's agenda. And that way then it, it automatically will go to Thursday's agenda um, to, to help fill that excess. Um, if we take that away, then we're going to that first Tuesday of the uh, second Tuesday of the month. That's why I said we could set that special meeting then on that at one o'clock, but it not be scheduled for it just to be automatically thrown to it. Uh, the agenda belongs to the city manager. And I agree with what the city clerk had stated that earlier meeting needs to be when the first readings are read and discussed because they take the longer amount of time. The second reading you've hashed over everything. Those are the ones that should be coming on the, the six o'clock meeting. And of course, avail the public, both of them, to comment. But I think the agendas can be handled <clears throat> in a more proper fashion, especially at those six o'clock meetings. My two cents. So do we want to keep on this schedule a one o'clock first Thursday meeting, or do we want to have it be the four o'clock I think we should have as our goal not using that Thursday meeting as an overflow meeting. Um, I'd like to get some experience with some of the time limits and things that you are proposing, um, Mayor Luke, and to encourage all of us to be prepared and succinct in our comments and not have the need for an overflow. But if it needs, and we schedule a special meeting. Well, Mayor, if I may. Sure. I'm looking at some of these Thursday, uh, Thursday meetings, and here's one where we had discussion about West Villages. We had discussion about uh, the wastewater treatment plant resolutions, more about West Villages. Um, I'd have to see how long the meeting actually went, but. Some of those Thursday meetings, we do accomplish a lot of stuff on those. They're, they're more, I don't want to say big ticket items, but they're more time consuming. Yeah, time consuming. Thank you. Um, discussion items. Um, and that's not to say that we couldn't do something like that, but to make it automatic so that it flows immediately over to that Thursday meeting. Um, I'd like to try to stay away from it. And if we need to adjust later in the year, adjust. But that that's my personal opinion. I'm just afraid of the one the six o'clock meeting is going to either run later because we're getting rid of the Thursday meeting, or that second Tuesday of the month is going to run longer because we're getting rid of it. I I, I don't know. I'm kind of on the fence about it. I, no. uh, I mean, if there's a um, 
collaboration, or I shouldn't say even collaboration, but if the city manager sets the agenda correctly and depending upon the time that it starts and we handle ourselves accurately, I think we could accomplish it. But again, you know, it's there if we want to call a special meeting at one o'clock. Um, we have the right, I believe, uh, the code says that a city manager plus one commissioner can call a special meeting. Isn't that correct, clerk? Okay. Uh, so if there needs to be a special meeting, if something huge is being addressed in Welland Park. What happens if somebody, if you don't have the hold, are we going to keep the hold on our calendars for that Thursday or are we going to remove the hold? And if we need a special meeting, it's going to be scheduled. Sometimes a commissioner, we may not that's be able a good to get point. a quorum. That, that, that's a good point. I mean, I don't mind having a hold on it, but I just don't like it being, you know, considered a regular meeting and we're not treating it that way prior to the meeting. So I don't mind putting a one o'clock hold, but scheduling the meeting at four o'clock. how it goes city manager i just wanted to uh, mention that we do have the welcome new employees uh at the once a month meeting at 1 1 p.m what we would do is we would have to put those onto the day meeting um because a lot, there's many employees that get off by you know 3 30 so that's the way it used to be done <laughs> until we started getting so so much on those agendas that yeah we pushed everything to there so then yeah it was convenient for that to be done well, all we right can do is try it and revisit it if it becomes to be too cumbersome and become a regular meeting again is everybody in agreement for just putting a hold at one o'clock on the first thursday but actually making the uh slotted time before for that meeting i concur that's okay yeah, I'm in agreement. So yes. Uh, and are we all in agreement that it is to be called a regular meeting instead of a special meeting at the no. four o'clock hour? Four o'clock, it's going to be a regular meeting? I will let city clerk speak to it. Yes, it'll be a regular meeting. We're going to put all the ceremonial items on there, but it will be scheduled, a regularly scheduled meeting, and those are the items that we'll put on there. So it's not going to be time certain. It will be a meeting at four. At four o'clock with those items. All right, everybody, good with that. So, is there anything else on the commission meeting draft that we need to address? We have uh, August sixteenth recommendation, and we did approve that. Correct. We got the consensus on that. Can I go one thing? Of course. On that recognition meeting, we need to go back to, and, and I don't know if we're going to have to change code or something like that, but we're going to have to go back to the 10 items for proclamations. Having 15 proclamations some months is, that's really a long time. And, and I think having it limited to the 10, I, I'm just throwing it out there. We used to have a limit of 10 proclamations each month. Um, and we have gotten to the point where there there are some months where we have only two or three, but then there's like months and months and months where we have 15. One month, I think we had every letter of the alphabet for proclamations. It, for our proclamation policy, it is commission approves them by us putting those in your um, inbox for you to sign. I don't think the clerk's office should be the one determining which one, which 10 we pick for that month. <laughs> So. <laughs> I, I hear you. I just, I, I just. I think also if you're concerned about the length of meetings, I, there's no requirement that the proclamations be read in their entirety, I don't believe. If they're not here, maybe we. Good idea. If they're, if they're not here, I, we I don't get, read it. I like that. And then you would just have it signed and give it to them. That. Because a lot of times that they'll say, hey, can we get a proclamation? And then there's nobody here to re receive it. I like that. Does everybody else like that? I like that. 
All right, anything else on the workshops? If for the, those who are new, um, we set aside a whole the first Monday of each month, except for August. And if there's no workshop needed or necessary, it's canceled. They usually cancel it about a week beforehand. All right. Anything else that you need on that one, City Clerk? You need a motion, City Clerk, on the changes that we made to the schedule. Just approve the um, the consensus. Approve them with the consensus. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve the um, the calendars for the commission meetings, special meetings, and workshops as presented, with the exception of the consensuses that were given. Second. Thank you very much. A motion on the floor by Commissioner McDowell to approve the um, district and commission meetings, special meetings, workshops, uh, seconded by Commissioner Langdon. Anything to that? Anything to that, Commissioner? Go ahead and take the vote. that it passes five to zero. Uh, on the next item, the board and committee assignments. Uh, these, everybody should have what the, the backup material that was supplied to you by the clerk. Um, we have, the first five are the Florida League of City committees, and there are five committees, there are five commissioners. Now, not every year has a commissioner been there. Uh, commissioner Hanks had some work schedules, so he didn't, I don't think for the last couple of years, served on one of the Florida League of City um, committees. But currently, uh, Commissioner McDowell, Vice Mayor Emmerich, and myself are assigned to those Florida League of Cities. Uh, Commissioner Iannotti and Commissioner Langdon, uh, do you have an interest? What's that? I said pick one. <laughs> do you have an interest in serving at the Florida League of City? There are three required meetings, basically, that you go to to represent the city. You're going to learn a lot. Uh, you're going to gain from interaction with all those other officials from the other cities. It's, it's a great experience. Uh, they set legislation uh, that goes to the state. So there's two of them that are open. And which two are they? Can you identify them? Yes, ma'am. Uh, the Municipal um, Administration and finance, finance, Taxation and Personnel. And just to let you know, those meetings don't take place until, I think it starts July, August, no, August, August. September, and October. So you're, you're good for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Where are these meetings? Very right pleasure. now, Zoom, <laughs> but uh, Orlando. And it, it, all of that expense is figured into your commission your expenses. That would be part of your training and your uh, travel that is already figured into your expenses. Thing is, is do you want to serve on one of those committees? And if you do, which one would you like? What are the three again? There's two that are available. The top two on your sheet. Do, do you have your sheet? Yeah, I've got the old sheet. Uh, um, no wonder. Municipal. <laughs> Great, thank you. Municipal administration, and then finance, taxation, and personnel. Of course, my eye immediately went to land use and economic development. Happened in. I'm not giving that one up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. When I'm gone, you can have it. <laughs> it, and it the longevity on these committees really, um, really served the city very well. I would... Uh... Take the municipal administration, if that's okay. Certainly. Good. I was thinking the other. Okay. 
will enjoy it. We just finished this session, so you won't be up for those committees until August of next year. Uh, going down from there, uh, we have the Coastal Heartland National Estuary Partnership. Um, Commissioner McDowell, do you still want to serve on that first chair? One second, I, I want to. What I would like to see is more evenly distributed. Um, I, I don't mind being on all these boards, but it is not helping anybody new by not being on some of these boards. And um, the past year or so, it, it was very top heavy for some commissioners and stuff. Um, I, I, I enjoy the Coastal to Heartland Estuary Partnership but I think there's a commissioner on here that would probably enjoy it even more um, because it's more his cup of tea. Mr. Iannotti, if, if you would like to take it, that would be fine. Um, otherwise, I'll just stay on it. It meets four times a year. Um, well, I want to drop off of the second chair on that one and the one under it. I'm sorry, which ones do you want to drop uh, off? Of? The Heartland National Estuary and the chat. I'm on a second chair for that. For those oh, you two. mean alternate? I, yeah, I don't want to okay. serve on those. And then chat, okay. So it's- so Commissioner Iannotti, are you interested in the estuary partnership that meets quarterly? And where does this meet? Down in Punta Gorda or Zoom lately? Yeah, sure. Okay, and then I'll be your backup. How does that sound? We'll just- Sounds wonderful. Uh, chat is the next one, and uh, Vice Mayor Emmerich has been serving on that one. Do you want to continue with that? I can, or I can have somebody else is interested in it. I would take the alternate, Mayor Luke, if you're looking to lighten your load. I am. Okay. Well, I'll stay on it with Ms. Langdon. Okay, sounds good. I would be interested in alternate for Peace River Water Alliance Board. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. Right. <laughs> There's some interesting tidbit on that. <laughs> All right. um, we'll get there. I serve on the uh, Sarasota County EDC. Mm -hmm. I need a somebody to back me up. I, I would take first chair on that if. If you want to I'm, save I'm some serving. time. No, that, that's fine. I've been serving on that, and I've only got the longevity into it. I'm, I'm really heavily invested in that. Uh, Minnesota League. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed. So, Mayor Luke, you're staying as, as the first. Serving. Right. And then uh, Commissioner Langdon's going to alternate. Sure. Um, Minnesota League. We need somebody to serve first chair in that. I'll be happy to move over to first chair since I was alternate. I'm Good. kind of familiar. I think I've only been to two of their meetings. Um, Would you explain what that is so the new ones know if they want to volunteer or not? <laughs> it's, it's, I don't know how to explain. Um, kind of mini Florida it's, League. It's like a mini Florida League. It works with Manatee County, Sarasota County, and we work on legislative priorities for our area, and then it kind of gets filtered upstream to Florida League of Cities. So, um, and, and I don't even know if I did it justice by explaining that. Okay, you did fine. Uh, it's kind of a state within a country. <laughs> it's a small part of the Florida League of City. So would somebody like to back up, be the alternate for Commissioner McDowell on that one. All right, let's skip that and come back to that one. Uh, MPO, uh, we actually, because of the size of our city, we have two seats um, for, so there's one opening as the commissioner and one opening for the alternate. I believe, Commissioner Iannotti, you said you were interested in MPO? Um, I don't know that my schedule would allow it. You want to be alternate? Yes. Okay. I would take the second seat take on second that. Take the second seat. You got it. Actually, we both attended. Yes. 
supposed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's supposed mm -hmm. to because the size we of the city. We get two seats. Yeah, we, we have two, two seats, seats up there. Yes. Uh, Peace River, you want to go ahead and I'm take, take this one? <laughs> All right, so I have been on this Peace River Water Alliance board now for four years. And we have met zero times. Wow. <laughs> okay. This board, we every year have a discussion as to what is this board, what does this board do, where does this board meet, and we give direction to get that information. We never get it, the information. And another year goes by. And we come back and have the same exact conversation as we did a year or two beforehand. At this point in time, cross this thing off the list and don't even mention it anymore. It's been four years. So Are we? The, lo the location truly varies then. The location <laughs> truly <laughs> doesn't even, I have no idea. And until somebody can tell us what this board is, where it meets, when it meets, all that kind of stuff, and give us that information, I'm done. I'm, I'm done with it. Appreciate your honesty. <laughs> Are we paying anything to I belong to this? Does anybody know? I think it's part of the Peace River Manatee Water Supply Authority. But when I go to those meetings, it's not even called this. Again, we have asked numerous times to give us information about what this board is, and nothing happens. All right. So, so if you want to ask one more year and give them a deadline of two weeks to give us this information, I say cut it out. Yeah, it only meets once a year anyhow. So what do you say? Cut it out. Cut it out. And obviously we're not wanting it there anyhow. You're no, I'm a no. <laughs> Cross it off the, the list, guys. All right. The next one is actually filled. Um, that is the the AAB. Yes. Uh, do you two want to stay in those positions? I would, yeah. You're Unless somebody else wants to take it over. Oh, I was the backup for what? Uh... Yeah, you haven't had to back up. Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'll still back up <laughs> if, I, if I don't have to. <laughs> All right. Um, visit Sarasota, which is the TDC. Uh, I sit as the commission, and uh, Commissioner McDowell's the backup. Um, I'm fine continuing. I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, and then on teen court, uh, I actually moved into the commission slot when a couple months ago when uh, Commissioner Hanks went off. I'm going to need somebody to back me up with teen court. I'd back you up with that. Thank you. And the only other things on here are already assigned to the duties. Any, oh, we had that one that Minnesota was left Minnesota League blanket. of Cities, the alternate. Yep. I can't back myself up. Why not? I can't, I, I haven't figured out how to pull myself. Um, how about I back you up then? Are Unless, sure? okay. um, one of you two. Okay. I'm no? good. All right, so put me down for the backup. All right, I believe that fills all of our blanks, correct? And just so you know, we do have, I'm on another one, which is the MPO task force, which meets prior to the MPO meeting. So I'm basically there all day. Just, just so you know, but, yeah, it's yeah. one of us two have to be there. So I did it okay. and I've been doing it. So no problem. Um, just looking at this real quick. Um, Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. I don't know if uh, Commissioner Iannotti wants anything additional besides the Coastal Department. No, I do not. Okay. Well, this is the time to get them. All right. City Clerk, do you need anything else on that? A motion to approve. We'll make a motion team. to approve the Commission Board and Committee assignments as dictated um, during discussion. Sorry. I have this motion on the floor by Vice Mayor McDowell, seconded, excuse me, uh, Commissioner McDowell, seconded by Vice Mayor Emrich, uh, to have the assignments to the boards and committees as stated. Anything to the motion? Go ahead and call the vote. Yeah. 
passes five to zero. Thank you very much. All right, we are on to E, which is discussion and possible action regarding the interim city manager hiring process. Uh, acting city manager, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is for discussion and possible action regarding the interim city manager hiring process. Um, cool. Go ahead. The following provides a chronological order of events on the interim city manager hiring process. On October the 27th, 2020, during the commission regular meeting, the commission appointed Julie Belia as acting city manager, effective November 13th, 2020, until the time when the commission appoints an interim city manager and allow her to work with city manager Lear. Uh, on November the 5th, 2020, during the commission's special meeting, the commission approved delaying the hiring process for an interim city manager until the new commission is seated with the agenda item for this topic occurring November 24th, 2020. Accordingly, uh, now that the new commission has been seated, staff seeks commission direction on the interim city manager hiring process. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do we have any public comment on this? I do, yes. Go ahead, please. Synonymous. Marty Black's consideration for city manager would create a conflict of interest and would not help the city move forward in the best manner. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't really know as we have questions, but we're going to have to have dialogue as to how we want to accomplish this. So who wants to start the discussion off? I'll do it. Go ahead, ma'am. This is a very difficult conversation to have, especially with a brand new board. Um, I am sure that everybody up here has been caught up to speed as to how we got to the situation. Um, with all due respect to acting city manager Belia, I've been on the job for what, five, six days now? Something like that? I spent a couple, spent about two, three weeks uh, with Mr. Lear and I assisted him, but by myself since. Um, November 14th. Right. Um, during the discussion of actually placing Ms. Balia in her position, I, I said it then and I will say it again. Um, I appreciate you stepping up and that you were appointed to it. However, I still am looking for somebody who is a credentialed city manager to lead us during this hiring process for a permanent city manager. Um, I, I think we, we need somebody with the experience. We need somebody to be able to keep things nice and smooth and flowing smoothly. Somebody who has the experience and the know-how of all the things that are happening within our city. There is a lot of stuff that's going on. And I firmly believe that whoever the interim city manager is, cannot be considered for the actual permanent city manager position. I, I think there has to be a distinction between the two roles. The interim is to get us through to hire an actual city manager um, because somebody could be an interim city manager and have underlining goals and objectives. And to me, we just need an interim and then get a permanent. Um, we, know, we need somebody who knows Northport. We need somebody that can, that's familiar with the ULDC rewrite, familiar with the parks transition, um, the, the new growth that's going on in the city, um, the de-annexation. And, and I think we have, we've heard this many times here in the meetings, we, we hear it on Facebook. We have two assistant city managers. One is already credentialed as a city manager. He knows everything that's going on in the city. I, I still do not understand the reasoning why he was overlooked for that role um, as acting city manager or even why he would be not considered as an interim city manager. Um, we need stability in our city. And I, I, I firmly believe that he could give us that. 
he did it when in July when the city manager was actually placed on leave. So those are my thoughts. I don't know where anybody else is going. To hire a firm to get an interim city manager, it, it defies logic because then you have to train that person. <laughs> um, and then there's the cost of that to hire somebody to find us an interim city manager. I'd rather spend the money for, and I think we're kind of going to be commingling the two conversations, so forgive me, um, hire somebody for finding a permanent city manager. Um, so those are my thoughts. I opened up the floor. I don't know where everybody else is. All right, who wants to be next? Uh, I think my thoughts uh, echo Commissioner McDowell's. Um, I would, without making a motion right now, um, I would think it would be in the best interest to appoint Assistant City Manager Yarborough as the interim and to hire a outside firm to do the search for the permanent city manager. This end, anybody have comments, thoughts, opinions? There, there when, when we talked about Mr. Yarborough and, and I've had conversations with him then and after and, and during, and when, when we first had this situation come up, there was, some things that went terribly wrong within the city. And at that point, I felt that it was not the proper person to put in the acting. I have since talked with him. We have gotten past those issues. Um, and and I, I fully support Mr. Yarbrough. I think he would be a good candidate here. So there were reasonings, and I'm not going to go into detail on what they are. If you don't know what they are, sorry. No problem. <laughs> No, don't want to know. <laughs> uh, Langdon. Yeah, I kind of approach it in terms of what do we want the interim manager to accomplish? So if we give that person a year, what's really the work we want them to do? Um, my priority areas... Um, we have some lingering personnel issues um, in the city. Um, won't rehash history, but um, so, so for me, the person who comes in needs to be able to address those issues um, in a totally unbiased way. So that would be number one. Um, Number two, when I think about moving this city forward, there is some foundational work that we need to do. We need to finish the ULDC um, once and for all. I mean, we need to get that cleaned up. Um, and what always troubles me a little bit with, with some of these conversations and votes is I sometimes feel like we're making decisions out of context with our strategic plan. So, um, and, and maybe it's just me as a new commissioner, but I feel the need to bond with the strategic plan and have some sense that when we're approving projects, that they're moving us along a path of achieving our vision for the city. So in addition to the nuts and bolts of the ULDC, I'd like someone who can come in and, and give us a, a process and a fresh view of our strategic plan and make sure that when we're making investments, that those investments are moving us toward our goal. Um, the, the other question, it's more of a question than a thought, but I understand that we have um, an external candidate who's interested in talking with us about um, being an interim city manager. I'd like to have some kind of process and discussion for evaluating our options. Um, I don't think it's here tonight, but... Um, 
you know, I think we really need to look at our options. What's the work that needs to be accomplished? I mean, as, as I mentioned, there are some things that I would like to have done by the time we have a new city manager, a permanent <coughs> city manager coming in. Um, I think we need to have that conversation and then take a look at our options and evaluate, we know of two, so uh, evaluate the pros and cons of both of those candidates against the work that needs to be completed this year. Thank you. Uh, before I let you have a second round, I'm gonna go ahead and speak. Uh, the strategic planning, if if you'll take note, I mean, in when we go through strategic planning, you'll understand even more, but on the legislative text to every item, there is a strategic plan attached to it. It has to be linked. Everything we do has to be linked to that strategic plan. So just to give you a heads up on that. Okay. Thank um, you for that. Of course. Uh, <coughs> the personnel issues, definitely. I mean, that that's why we have uh, a lot of things incomplete. Uh, so there's definitely some things that need to be addressed with that. Uh, I, again, will reiterate um, because of the division that is within the city, I think it needs to be an outside individual. Uh, we do have a candidate who has uh, thrown their hat into the ring, so to say, uh, that does know this city very well. And I agree with you. There needs to be, you know, an idea of what we want accomplished. And how is that path of the least resistance going to be obtained? Um, thank you for sitting down, uh, Vice Mayor Emmerich, and speaking with Mr. Yarborough. Um, that's the kind of peace that needs to be had. Uh, it definitely does. Uh, he ran a really good city uh, during that time of strife and conflict and everything else, and I would never deny him what he did. But because there's still the divisions, I think having somebody who's extremely knowledgeable and knows the cleanup that needs to go on and enough brass tack to do it um, come into place. Uh, look, evaluate the city and um, help us get it, get us on the right path. I'm in full agreement that whoever the interim is cannot be the regular, cannot throw their head in for the regular city manager. So let's discuss, we're supposed to be talking about um, process. So Commissioner McDowell, um, go ahead. Well, the only thing is, is we have to be very careful if we're going to be discussing personnel issues. That's a very slippery slope that could get us all into a lot of hot water. We have very little say on how the city manager runs the day-to-day -day operations in his staffing levels. That is beyond our scope of, of responsibility. That's the city manager's responsibility for us to say that we want the city manager to do fill in whatever blanks with staff. I'm not even going to have that conversation because it is very borderline and infringing on our distinctly separated roles by charter. Um, I, the gentleman that is thrown his hat in the ring, I absolutely admire. He he is an upstanding individual. I could never take away any of his credentials or his willingness to serve our city. My issue is the role that he plays with the West Villages. Their perception is reality, whether it's our perception, perception is reality. The perception is there could be a conflict of interest. And I've had citizens reach to me. I've had professionals reach to me. I've had just conversations with, with people I know. And that perception could cause us harm. 
and I will not take that chance with all due respect. Um, my understanding, and, and I, I don't know the business, but currently is even a consultant for the West Villages. Um, it may not fit well to have him come in to this role immediately after attending resignation for an entity that has citizens want to de-annex from an entity that is a major player in our city. It, it, it is a concern of mine. Um, and with that said, um, I could not go that way. So if we don't hire what we have here, and Commissioner Langdon, God, I hope it doesn't take us a year to find a city manager. I hope to God it takes six months or less. Um, there, there is ways to do that. Um, I think having the stability within our city of things that are happening versus hiring an outsider, um, even, even through ICMA or the FCCCMA, whatever it is, they have a pool of candidates and just hiring one from that pool. There's that massive learning curve. And, and for a short time, that's not something I'm willing to, to do. Um, so I, I, I will yield the floor. Um, I appreciate the vote of whoever it is. The interim can never apply for the city manager job. And we will have to make that a motion and vote on it. Um, so. Ryan, do you have anything further? I would just say that um, I echo some of the same sentiments that it, it does not seem logical to me to go outside for something that's interim. By its very definition, it's interim. It's until we find a city manager. We have someone who is qualified to do that. Uh, would only be logical to me that we utilize um, assistant city manager. Anything further? Second round? Over? Yeah, I'd say a second round. I, I would share that my one hesitation um, with our external, potential external candidate is his association with West Villages, but I don't feel I've had adequate time or preparation to assess how big of an issue that is. Um, so I'd appreciate the ability to do that. Um, that would be my only hesitation with that candidate. And I'm, I'm I don't know about the, my fellow commissioners, but I'm just feeling the need for some type of fair evaluative process. Um, where we can take a look at both candidates. What's the work that needs to be done? The two candidates, if there are issues, do our due diligence to assess um, if just how big the issues are and if they can be resolved. I just don't feel I've had adequate time to do that. Vice Mayor Image. Yeah, I'm just thinking about a few things here. We haven't had the discussions on you know, cost factors or anything like that. We have not, you know, had the opportunity to talk with either one of these individuals in length. And if we're talking about a process, I think we ought to be able to set up a process to where we can have those discussions and make an ed educated decision going forward. You know, like Commissioner Langdon said, she hasn't had the opportunity. So is she comparing apples to apples? She doesn't know. You know, I've had very limited conversations with both of these individuals going forward. And to make sure that this is the best fit for the city, I think we need to take that time and do that. You know, I think that's fair to both the individuals and to this commission and to the citizens. More education. Okay. Um, go ahead, Commissioner McDowell, you want to state something? I was going to make a motion. Whenever y'all are ready. Okay, um, I'm, I'm hearing two different things. Sounds like one group wants to go with 
Assistant City Yarborough immediately. And the other wants a process put in place for two candidates to be reviewed. Um, I think that would be an extremely short amount of time, like a week or something like that, um, because HR would have to have everything for the outside candidate, you know, to address, make sure all of them are qualified and, and that type of stuff. So that is my thought of, because it's going to take HR a little bit to decide if we're going to be looking at two different candidates. Um, and let me back up. Are we only wanting to view the two right now? Are we wanting to go to FLC or ICMA and drag in any more or just this is, and this is what I don't understand. This is for an interim position, correct? So now we're going to talk about having interviews for an interim position. I mean, shouldn't we be talking about having interviews for the permanent appointee? Okay, point taken. An interim position. I mean, this is, I think, what we should be focused on. This is the task. Um, that, that's all I'd add. All right. Um, Commissioner McDowell, do you... Still want to make a motion? The light went off. Right, I'm ready. I, Whenever you're ready to make a motion, just say the word and I'll be happy to do it. Okay. Uh, I have a light on for... Um, yeah, I, I definitely would not want to do a search for an interim position, but we have two candidates on the table. And so I think we owe it to them and to ourselves to do a review of two candidates. Um, I would be very comfortable putting a time limit on it. I think we should have a goal of having an interim manager in place before the end of the year. Um, but I think we owe it to the city to take a look at the two candidates who are interested in the position. I think um, setting it at the end of the year, I mean, our last meeting before the holidays is the 8th of December. So by the 8th. Exactly. It would have to be, there would have to be a decision by the 8th. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and give the floor to Commissioner McDowell. I got two motions, Mayor. Okay. First motion is to um, exclude any interim from the application pool as a city, permanent city manager. Okay, the first motion is to um, bar the interim city manager for applying for the regular city manager. Is there a second to that? I'll second. Okay, there is a motion on the floor and a second. I have the city attorney's light on first, though. City attorney? Yes, ma'am, I have concerns. That would be an illegal prohibition. A what? An illegal prohibition. You can't prohibit one person from applying applying for a job. When the applications come before the commission to look at the final you know, appointment of a permanent city manager, you can discuss you know, who you want at that time or whether or not it's a disqualifier. But I have legal concerns about saying one person cannot apply for a job opening. OK. Um, with hearing what the city attorney has to say, um, how about the motioner and the seconder? Do you want to continue with your motion? City attorney, is there a way to, is there a, is there another way to possibly phrase the motion that would not make it illegal, but still accomplish what the goal of the motion is? Well, if I understand the goal of the motion, it's to keep a specific person from applying for a job. Yeah. Well, that's what I have concerns with. I removed my motion. Reluctantly. Based on what city attorney said. <laughs> and it's I'm blaming you. <laughs> right. um, you had another motion? I have another motion. Okay. Um, I make a motion to appoint uh, the 
Assistant City Manager Yarborough to be the interim city manager effective uh, November 27th um, to be the interim city manager. And I'm trying to think about the pay part. I'm going to take my motion back for a moment. Um, I'm trying to remember how we did it for. We put him on the low base. I think it was 144,000. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll make a motion. Thank you for, for the, the time to think this through. Of course. Um, make a motion to appoint uh, Assistant City Manager Yarborough to be the interim city manager effective um, November 27th um, at the pay salary of, I think it was $144,000 that he had when he was the, inter the acting city manager in July. All right, there's a motion on the floor to place um, Assistant City Yarborough in for the interim city manager position on November 27th with the pay of 144,000. Do I have a second? Of course we have to ask him. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, that was made by Commissioner McDowell, seconded by uh, Commissioner Iannotti. Before we proceed with the vote, um, could I ask Assistant City Manager Yarborough would you come forward and let us know whether you would accept this or not? Jason Yarborough, Assistant City Manager. Yes, ma'am. I'm here to, to serve the community and uh, the board as needed. Thank, Thank you, me. sir. All right, is there anybody else to speak to that motion? All right, we'll call the vote. And that passes four to one. Commissioner Langdon, do you want to state anything? Yeah, I'll, I'll just state that my reason for dissenting is I believe we should take a look at um, both candidates in light of the work that needs to be accomplished this year. And I know the one from the outside um, would have, could have been excellent. So, may I speak? Of course. I want to thank. Mr. Black, for wanting to step up and serve our city. I am greatly appreciative of that. And at the same time, I also want to thank Acting City Manager Balia for stepping up and fulfilling the role in this short time. I know that you are doing a fantastic job um, in the short interim, and I appreciate you stepping up, and thank you for that. Right, before we leave this one, uh, I'm going to speak to Mr. Black also. Thank you. Um, admirable. I read your resume and it blew me away. I thought I knew you and I didn't even know a quarter of you. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we'll be doing business together in the future as we have in the past, but your desire for this city uh, to be the best that it can be is very humbling. And um, thank you so very, very much. And hopefully we'll have discussions on things in the future for the city because your ideas are brilliant and bright. Thank you, sir. Thank you again. All right. So... We are on to the last item of the agenda, and that is F. 10 minutes. It's been a couple hours. <laughs>
What time yeah, is it? Was, Nine thirty. Yeah. <laughs> no, I just look. Yeah, I think we went seven thirty. Yeah, so yeah. it's been a couple hours. <laughs> All right. Can we just take 10 minutes? Because this one may be the wrong one. I don't know. Ten but just break. to be. All right, 10 minute you. break. Uh, <laughs> it is 9.35. We'll come back at 9.45. Thank you.
Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is for discussion and possible action for recruitment of a permanent city manager. At a recent commission meeting, there was a discussion about seeking direction from the city commission with the newly installed commissioners regarding recruitment for a new city manager. Although there are multiple recruitment methods, there are primarily two options. And at this time, if I may, if we could please call up interim city manager Yarborough to provide the presentation. I didn't turn yet. Oh, excuse me, future interim. <laughs> <laughs> Interim city manager. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, see, let's see how many. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jason Yarborough, uh, assistant city manager. Um, typically, on, on these things, um, you know, there's one of two ways you go. Uh, there, there's a hybrid way, but most people don't do that way. You can use your HR department to, to handle the recruitment. Um, that has the benefit of, uh, of cost containment, or, or not cost containment. Reduced cost versus going external. Um, for a city of our caliber and size, um, I would recommend uh, option two is to use a recruit an executive recruitment firm. Uh, it will cost you typically. It'll cost you probably twenty five to forty five. Probably on the lower end of that, if I had to guess. Um, you are, you know, it may be, you may have a natural inclination to say, well, let's just use HR. Our HR department is very small. It's very time consuming um, uh, to bring in candidates to, to handle the processing. I'm not saying that they can't do it, but it will be taxing on top of everything else that's already going on with them. Um, there's a, a lot of balls in there up in HR. <clears throat> the, the value of using an executive recruiter is that they know, they make it their business to know who's looking unofficially. They, know, they can pick up the phone and call people who uh, may be looking. HR's, HR departments typically aren't set up to, re, to use these outreach strategies that an executive recruiter will use to find the best candidate that's the right fit. Um, HR can cast a wide net, net but you can get everybody from Joe Schmo, um, you know, who's working at the 7-Eleven, not that there's anything wrong with working at 7-Eleven, <laughs> yeah. um, to come and apply versus a targeted strategic approach once the executive recruiter has worked with you to find out exactly what you're looking for. Again, having been a city manager for many years and a city administrator, having been part of a um, you know, finalist for uh, you know, like Des Moines Waterworks and worked with executive recruiters, they can really help you with your profile of who he or she you're looking for to lead your organization. And they have more robust outreach strategies to help bring in the right candidate for you. So um, the, the only other advice I'd give you or, or recommendation I'd give you is go slow until you find the right candidate. Don't settle and uh, make sure that you have a competitive compensation package. Don't go cheap. Um, the, the other thing is that you're also in competition now with some other things that are in play. You got city of Sarasota um, that that position looks like it's opening up. Then it appears that you know Manatee County, county administrator or county manager, that position is about to open up. So you have some competition in the immediate area. Um, and with that, I'll be here to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any questions for interim city manager? Uh, just, just one. When you mentioned twenty-five to forty-five, you were referring to thousand. I apologize. Okay. Yes, sir. Twenty-five thousand right. to forty-five thousand. Just want. It was sure. probably on the lower end of, right. of it, but yeah. Any other questions? It really depends on how robust. I mean, I've seen assessment centers set up. You know, I've seen. There's a lot of a lot of different ways. You know, uh, some some places have. When I went after Des Moines Waterworks <coughs> as a general manager. They had interviews not only with the board, not only with one-on-one -on -one with the boards, but they also had, um, uh, they picked uh, a group of employees to do interviews, and, and all of that kind of worked into the mix. They also had a community uh, mm -hmm. interaction session um, with that as well, and that's a common practice too. So it really depends on how deep and how robust you go um, that will kind of dictate some of that cost. But, you know. In the state of Florida, I've seen them average around 25. 
But I gave you a larger range in case y'all wanted to go with something really exotic. Any other questions? Ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Um, so Commissioner Langdon was saying a year to do this, and I like, oh, what is a fair estimate? I know we have the holidays coming up. So so let's say we use that time to start getting a recruitment firm. How long to get a recruitment firm to getting it, applications to actual hire? What what would be the process, would you say? Well, the good or the bad news is that there's a kind of a, a, a small group of executive recruiters that specialize in the city manager, local government executive field. Um, they're all listed up, up at ICMA. Uh, there are also some of them, all of them are listed in that uh, guideline book I gave you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, depending on whether uh, we... If I, if I remember my purchasing guidelines right, if it's within a certain dollar threshold, then uh, the interim city manager, all, all he or she has to do is go out and get quotes. But, you know, if we don't have to do the formal proposal process and do the quote process, that can be done relatively quickly in, in you know, I think probably 30 to 60 days. And to we'd have a firm. firm to bring back uh, or some firm along with pricing to bring back to you for recommendation or you can empower uh, the 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 interim city manager to find your recruiting firm and and that will cut out some of the time and then y'all can start working directly with that recruiting firm that's hired to build your your candidate profile but it really depends on what, how much you know do y'all want to select the executive recruiting firm do you want to you know if it's within a certain dollar threshold at the city the interim city manager f hire that person, and then that will cut some time out. Um, an executive recruiting firm typically is going to probably speed up the process for you versus HR because they will usually have a good handle within your state and within your 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 region of the country who is in interested in moving on or or looking for a new challenge. So because you're saying it's between the twenty five and forty five thousand dollar threshold, um, it doesn't have to go through that entire doesn't procurement process. Yeah. And maybe I don't this so. is a question for city attorney. Can <coughs> can we task the city manager, I'll, I'll just, the interim city manager, um, with the responsibility to work with HR to hire a firm, and then give parameters of what we're looking for for a city manager? Or do they come back and, does the firm then come back and give a presentation to commission on? Good evening, Christine McDade, Human Resources Director. Um, we, we use your executive search firms for our chiefs, um, our assistant city attorney, and that's what we did. We, had, did, we created scope of services for the procurement process, which is a uh, request for quotes. And I think everything you said, Jason, I want to mirror Please, that. I may have spoken no, I, I think it, it's pretty <coughs> accurate. We do have the challenge of it being the holidays, mm -hmm. but I think 30 to 60 days is, is a reasonable amount of time. We'll work with finance. Um, what we've done in the past, we create a scope of services, send it out through their demand star, which is their uh, uh, vend, um, what do we call that? Uh, quote, quote system. Quote system. Sorry, I'm not finance. And then we get back some. Uh, um, some quotes, get back some proposals, and we review those. And what we've done in the past is bring them back to you all. Generally, we've, we've made a recommendation with a firm, but we'll have all the others as well so that you can look at and make a decision. But that's how we've done it, and it's been pretty successful. But we can set some parameters in time. And and I would go with that amount, too. I was going to say 25 to a little bit less, but 25 to 30. Uh, I, would, I would like to speak to that. Uh, because it is the holiday time, I think with the knowledge that our interim has in regards to these uh, search teams, uh, I'm comfortable with allowing him to pick them personally myself. And that way we don't have to call a special meeting or wait until January or anything of the sort. Um, it can march ahead. 
But that's if, my, that's my if we give him the parameters for hiring the search firm, does those parameters include what our wish list is for the city manager um, qualifications? And, and they're going to come in and build a profile of the candidate that you want. They're going so to they're come gonna in look. And... You, know, you want somebody with ten years of city management experience. You want a credentialed manager. I'm just throwing out things now. You know, you want somebody that has been in a full service city that has fire police. You know, they're going to build a candidate profile for you once you bring them on board. So that would be like a future agenda item with this firm they're and this commission yeah. to figure out what our what you want. goal for this magical person to be. Gotcha. Walk on water. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see that one. All right. Well, uh, that just cut down a lot of the conversation. <laughs> Anything from this side? No, I agree with you. I think we need to go and roll with it, and let's get it going. Make a motion. Want me to make a motion? Go, go ahead. I'll make a motion to instruct uh, interim city manager or acting city manager, whoever, um, to work with HR in hiring a firm and coming back for a future agenda item for discussion on what the actual qualifications the commission is looking for. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second to I'll that second. motion? Oh, we, have, second. we have the dueling, the dueling seconds. I did hear uh, Vice Mayor Emmerich's voice first. So motion was made by uh, Commissioner McDowell to have interim city manager. Dollar threshold, you may want to give us a dollar. I'm sorry? You may want to give us a dollar cap. Expenditure cap. $30,000. Okay. Is that okay as the second? The $30,000 cap for the firm. Okay. Yes, I'm good with that unless it's, unless they find out that the numbers ain't savvy. Uh, I, mean, that, I apologize. That, I apologize. Uh, the, the, yeah, if you would. I'm over here whispering. So, we use an executive search firm for the assistant city attorney after we had trouble filling the position with someone, you know, adequately qualified. Um, and we got three quotes from finance and went with one. They were, well, we got two. One, one um, was not interested. And then the numbers were fairly similar and they were both, it was 25000 plus the cost of posting ads. So it was a little bit more than that. And I think from talking to the recruiter, it sounds like that the search that we did, while it was very robust, is not quite as robust as what they do for a city manager because there are more elements. They have public meetings and they meet different stakeholders and things. So I don't know anything about this world, but just since our recruitment cost that much for a position that was, for a recruitment that had fewer elements, I would think that it may cost more than that for a full city manager recruitment. I, I tend to agree with that. I mean, uh, he said, 25 to 45, I would rather go to the high end and not have them have to come back to us telling us that it's short. I'd we will obviously be mindful of the exactly. dollars, but but uh, we won't necessarily have to come back if, if you want. So as the seconder, if we put it to the 45? Oh, I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay. City clerk, is that is that acceptable motion making? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. We have a a uh, motion on the floor by Commissioner McDowell to have interim city manager Yarborough work with uh, HR in selecting a search team uh, in the cap with it capping at 45,000. It was seconded by uh, Vice Mayor Emmerich. Anything to that motion? I do have one follow up question. Sure. How are we paying for all of this? We, we have, uh, <laughs> well, we have somebody you, that's you have some working. salary savings that well, you're going to um, ex yeah. have um, that and also we we have fund balance and things that we can we can take into okay yeah. I, we have we can fund money okay I just want to make sure that we're not giving you direction and we don't have a way to fund it that's yes, ma'am okay thank you trying to be mindful I appreciate the base the vacant position provides money for this also so anything else? Two, okay, let's call the vote.
And that passes five to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, uh, I guess we didn't need that break. <laughs> I was expecting that to be a long conversation. Oh, no, that's, that's fine. I figured that would be easier than the interim. Uh, do we have public comment? I do not. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to go on to uh, Commission Communications. Uh, Commissioner McDowell, we'll start with you, please. <clears throat> Boy, this is unusual. Usually I'm last. Yes. Um, there is one thing, if you remember when we were talking about assignments uh, for the um, appointments, yeah. and I went, oh, it's yes, because I, I forgot that. one. What was there was it? one for the WKDW radio station. Um, WKDW radio, we do a third Monday of the month. I already talked to the clerk. Okay. She has the schedule. She'll be passing, passing around, around like we have in the past okay. to sign up for yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure. So I think there's... Going on. Yeah. We're covered through December, but Correct. starting in January. Starting in January. Okay. Yeah. So the way that works Thank is um, John Rawlings show, WKDW, on the third Monday of the month, one commissioner comes and is the guest speaker to talk about city business from the commission's perspective. If he lets you. If, <laughs> um, exactly. So usually we pass this sheet around and you pick the months that you want to do it and then you pick the alternate months. Um, there will be two uh, months for each of us and then there's two months that a third person is going to do it. Usually it's a mayor, vice mayor for that third month. Um, so I'm just wanted to make sure that that was discussed. It's all taken it care of. Thank yes. you. All right. The commission gave in the past a direction, and I don't know if it carries forward each election year because it is two years to send out congratulation letters to the newly elected officials in Sarasota County, whether it be the county um, commissioners or other municipality commissioners. Um, I think it's a very goodwill gesture to say, hey, welcome um, to the uh, being a commissioner, congratulations, and we're here to work with you. Um, I don't know if those letters have gone out, I want to ensure that they do go out in a very timely manner. It's already been about three weeks. Um, I wanted to bring this up at the November 10th meeting, but because I was up in the cloud, I just completely forgot. So um, I don't know if we want to yeah. give consensus yeah. again. Let's let's get a consensus to send those congratulatory. And, and I... I would like to take it a step further and just be at standard operating procedure that each election, that these go out automatically with a mayor's signature on it, that we don't have to remember to keep doing this. Um, and I don't know who, who would be tasked to draft that letter, if it's clerk or if it's city manager's office, but I think the mayor's signature from the commission um, is warranted, so. Acting city manager. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we're actually already working on that. Uh, Pete left instructions that that's to be done every year, okay. whenever there's an election. Yes, ma'am. Need the consensus then. No, ma'am. We're okay. working on Thank it. You. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, so then Christmas card lists. That's another thing that we do. Last year we were a little bit late, so I want to make sure we get a good jump and head start on that. Um, so I think that's the city clerk's office. Usually they send a, a list around saying, do you still want to send them to these people? Sometimes people change their roles. Sometimes it's a other commissioner that's no longer serving. Um, so I don't know if that list is going to be going around soon. Okay. What, what we did was tweaked it. I mean, they yeah. sent it to all of us because some of us know people who may have switched positions. So all it was was tweaking it before we put the address on it. Yeah, and it might just be easier to send one list to each, to send one list and each commissioner work off of that one list that way then you're not marrying five. Uh, I'm just, so. And then maybe get Christmas cards so we can start signing them. Okay, and. Okay. Okay, no, then we'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. Um, where are we 
with the Sarasota County Parks Transition Agreement. I know we gave direction to work with Sarasota County to see about possibly renegotiating it. We're, we're getting to be at crunch time here. And um, got a tag team coming yay. to take care of this. I believe one is trying to prep for we're it and the other one's in conversation. In June? Correct. Oh, uh, gosh. For the record, Sandy Funheller, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, so uh, we, Parks and Recreation, has been working with finance uh, to bring back the budget amendment. Um, if you recall, during the budget meeting, uh, the uh, amount for fiscal year 21 it was 464 670 um, was pulled out and put on a priority list we were hoping that the county might come to the table and negotiate a little bit further um, that has not happened and we are on a bit of a timeline in order to be ready to take over those operations in June uh, so we are, have been talked to finance about getting that budget amendment in January so it could have two readings and be approved so that we could start our recruitment process in February. Um, we have been working with Fleet uh, to get the equipment and the vehicles that were approved in the CIP um, ordered. My understanding is that they need to be ordered probably, they need to be on the agenda the first meeting in January in order to get here on time, hopefully, <laughs> if we don't have any um, delays with COVID or anything like that. Uh, we have met with IT to review um, timeline for technology needs uh, for the, both the reservation side and uh, the maintenance side. Uh, we've met with HR to review the recruitment and hiring timelines. And uh, we have talked to the county about um, instituting monthly transition meetings starting in January. So that's where we're at with it. Um, there was some discussion. Um, Jason can probably provide more information on where the negotiation left that off. That was my next question. Thank you. But but thank you. Thank you for that update. For being on top of it, for prepping yourself, for all of those things that you just named. That's what has to be done to prepare. And thank you for doing that. Uh, we gave you a very skeleton budget. <laughs> And so we're looking to finance to supply the funds. So I'm very thankful that you're doing the job that you called to do to prep for that. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Jason Yarbrough, Assistant City Manager. When I was acting manager, I was having um, conversations with the county administrator um, about some possible Correct. options. However, when I stopped being acting, uh, those conversations between me and him stopped. I don't know what uh, I don't know the what additional conversations Mr. Blair had. Um, I can pick those back up. Yes, uh, please and, do. And, and, yes, and then see where we're at. <clears throat> um, but but as you know, uh, we didn't have a lot of conversation about uh, an overall um, um, pushing the all the parks back. Uh, it was more discussion about one or two parks. Uh, so, the what I'm, bottom line I'm trying to communicate is that there will be some small savings if if it happens. It's not going to be a huge amount. Uh, so, um, parks, you're definitely going to have to plan for the overall um, uh, takeover. It won't, it won't be a, a mass. It won't be a, a, a saving grace that comes in at the last minute to, to save the day. It, it'll only be like one or two parks that we're talking about. Any kind of savings to me is saving the day by all <coughs> us when, when we skin that thing so bad as we yeah. did. Uh, can, can we get? Can I finish? Go ahead. Yeah. Quick? So since you already started having conversations <clears throat> with County Administrator Lewis, <clears throat> and when you take over as interim city manager, is that something you could kind of prioritize to try, sure. not only to maybe get the ball rolling again? Yeah. Or maybe County Administrator Lewis will tell you, hey, we did this, this, and this, and this. Sorry you didn't get that memo. I hope. I, I'm hoping that is, will you please communicate whatever those findings are as soon as possible to the commission? Sure. I know that you're trying to make decisions, budgetary decisions. Uh, but yes, I will get that information as soon as possible. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll give you, I'll give you regular updates. Um, that being said, uh, 
informal conversations is not something that we really need to broadcast all over Kingdom Come right. until they get more solidified. So well, we, we, when I give you updates, I may ask you to, uh, things are in flux, mm -hmm. so don't bank on them and don't, and don't take it to the bank. Okay. So. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that conversation. Yes. I'm glad I asked that question. Me too. Um, so my last one is I attended the National League of Cities Conference. Uh, they have a cities conference every year for my new fellow commissioners. And it's held at various cities. Um, one year it was in Charlotte. One year it was in LA. One year I think it was San Antonio. I didn't go to that one. I did. Um, this year was to be held here in Tampa. Well, because of COVID, it was a virtual conference. Um, I will make no bones about it. I do not like virtual conferences. <laughs> it was... Uh, Just like the cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, well, they, there's no cheesecake for dessert. That's for sure. You, a virtual cheesecake does not taste good. Um, but there's no interaction with other officials. And there's no camaraderie. Um, this... This conference was very strictly focused on COVID. COVID, 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 COVID to death, COVID. And it was like, eh. Um, we did have a couple of conversations about guaranteed income, um, citizens getting a guaranteed income. Don't quite understand how that works, who qualifies, who gets paid for, but it's a quick little conversation. Uh, never heard of it before. And then a P3 was being discussed. And then there was a lot of COVID support for businesses and education, educations. Um, I would love to share materials. Usually after these conferences, I, I make up a little thing if anybody's interested in seeing, learning what I learned, but that couldn't be done this year. Um, for the record, I have no intentions of ever doing a virtual conference again because virtual cheesecake is not good. <laughs> no. All right, Commissioner Iannotti, do you have anything for commission comment? I do not. Okay, Commissioner Emmert? No, ma'am. All right, uh, I also attended the NLC conference. I attended the Florida League of City conference. Oh, I and <laughs> yes, it, I mean, the virtual does take away from the one-on-one -on -one in person. Um, I sat in on some of the racial uh, equity and different things that is going on. And I'm telling you what, you get outside of the city, that is the news, you know, COVID and racial equality and equity. Uh, I also sat on the MPO panelists for um, an event that they had a week or so ago. Great. I mean, I absolutely loved it. I took back feedback to staff. Uh, after the meeting from, from being able to sit on that. Uh, we had a EDC meeting. We did the director's review. Uh, Loveland had a ribbon cutting in Port Charlotte that I attended, go Loveland. Uh, Stuff the Cruiser was very good. They didn't have it over at the marketplace. They had it at the big Walmart. And I believe it was five cruisers that were filled with food and $1,200, I believe you told me, was collected in donations. So good job to our police force. Uh, there was a teen court meeting this month also. I did attend the swearing in of the county commission. Um, boy, was Parks and Rec ever busy this past weekend. <sighs> They had the gun show going. They had the concert in the park. The very next morning, they wake wake up and got the craft sale, yard sale. Very busy. Job well done. Uh, the Thousand Day Mural. I brought this up on the dais. It is moving forward. They have selected uh, the artists from Northport to actually do the mural. You guys will see that when they finish it. But the great thing is... Um, Gulf Coast Community Foundation said we want to pay for the Northport mural. Nice. So that will be placed on an agenda when it gets to that to that point. Uh, just FYI, some people are asking why our advisory boards can't have or aren't doing virtual meetings. Um, when the governor ceased that 
order, um, they no longer can do it. City Attorney, do you want to speak to that? What you said correct is, Mayor, the uh, governor's order allowed us to utilize virtual attendance toward reaching a quorum, and that applied to the city commission. It also applied to advisory boards when that order expired on November 1st. Uh, so did that opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. And my last thing is when I was at swearing in of the county, uh, I ran into Dennis, who's from Swift Mud. Uh, the one thing on the MPO meeting that I didn't like, they didn't talk about Legacy Trail in Northport. It was Legacy Trail in the North County. So I hit Dennis, the representative for the government municipalities, hit him up afterwards. And uh, he sent to me, he said, we had some correspondence with Sarasota County, and I believe we reached an agreement in theory as to solutions to the outstanding issues. This is because Swift Mud was kind of holding back some of the takeover or the designations for the Deer Prairie Creek area. These solutions will be dealt with in a resulting management agreement that we are presently working on with Sarasota County and not a part of the construction plans. So our understanding is that the construction will be proceeding on schedule. So that's the latest and greatest on uh, Legacy Trail. Uh, administrative reports. Acting City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I met today with the uh, Human Resources Director, and one of the topics of our discussion was some COVID precautions. Um, she has been uh, having meetings with some of her counterparts in the area and some of their precautionary measures they're taking in city and county facilities. Um, so she's pre preparing a memorandum with some recommendations, and we're going to discuss those next week. Um, as you know, we do have uh, the Neighborhood Development Services Department, Planning and Zoning, and Utilities. Those offices are closed for public access. They have alternative access right now. We have had some uh, p test positive cases amongst the city employees as well as exposures. So we are trying to be cognizant of that. We're also, she's also going to be taking a look at um, potential uh, work schedules, remote working, and things like that of that nature. Uh, something else we would like to take a look at is in this city chambers, as far as some precautionary measures, perhaps uh, putting up sneeze shields at the dais. Many governments uh, have them, uh, but, but I just want to bring that up as a suggestion, uh, as well as perhaps having staff, when they do presentations, sit down and socially distance at the conference tables rather than congregating here at the podium. So that's just some of the things we're taking a look at. And I've already mentioned, um, oh, excuse me, we have increased also since we've had the test positives, especially here at City Hall, uh, more uh, proactive disinfecting. Uh, we have the schedule of meetings for facilities that we always uh, go in and do the disinfecting once a meeting is held. Um, and I did mention earlier about the team building and the retreat. So those are my items. Uh, do you need consensus for the sneeze guard or that, or that's something that you guys will be producing to put in barriers in between us? Yes, ma'am. If, if it's the will of the commission, I'd like to go ahead and, and schedule our facilities to construct them. We build those in-house so we can do it at a lesser cost. And it would partition between the commissioners with plexiglass similar to what the other offices have. Yes, ma'am. protects would... us as commissioners. Yes, ma'am. Um, what do you say? Yes. I'm a yes? Yes. Okay. All right, you have it. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. And city attorney? I have nothing there. City clerk? As Mayor McDowell stated, we <laughs> will be sent, I'll be sending this around. I'll put it in your inbox if you could just pass it down. This is for the radio show. Um, also, for the commission um, Christmas cards, we can either have commission all put their signature on a sheet and have the cards printed with the signatures on there, or they can be signed individually by each commissioner. I believe we have about seven, a little over 700 employees in the city. So it is up to commission on which you prefer. All right, discussion time. Who wants to sign it and who wants it to be your handwritten imprint on it. 
What do you say? Printed. I'm a printed. Printed. I'll hand it myself. I'll sign it myself. I think it gives that personal touch. Um, I'm I'm a print. So can we put the four on and let her sign? Absolutely. As, okay. Sound good? All right. Anything for the good of the order? One other question. City Clerk, could you put on our calendars this retreat thing and stuff that Acting City Manager was talking about? Because I haven't seen it on my calendar yet. Yes. Thank you. I want to make sure that uh, it's not conflicting. That's all. Anything else? It is 1021 and we are adjourned. Six minutes. Six minutes.